I'm going to set an alarm for that actually in parking. Get shafted. Uh, Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinet Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinet. So, a quick few announcements before we get started for the conversation today. First, Cabinet State Trial, we're gauging access, we're gauging, gauging interest in our, in our crowdfunding campaign on Refunder. So, learn more info about that, become an earlier investor, and to learn, of course, to learn about the risks. Go to https refunder.com slash Kevin's HR. Next Friday, July 7th, we're doing a hackathon along with the company DevMatch. Hackathon's going to be um, July 7th, 1 to 3 p.m. at Star Paul, University of Washington. We're actually going to have a hacker that solves Kevin's HR problems. And then probably the biggest event, July 25th, I'm putting on a, a pitch competition hosted by the Maritime Blue um, Incubator in Tacoma and sponsored by Byron Robinson, uh, Robinson Company. Uh, company. So the pitch competition will be three to five minutes. Pitch however you want to. We're going to have prizes. Like Byron's giving us some great prizes. Close.com's um, supplying $1,500 in, in sales subscriptions. And uh, Z Account is providing six months of accounting for $9, $99 a month. I mean, bookkeeping, excuse me. So our guest today is Alec Vaslaw. Alec, ready to be great today? Yeah, thanks for having me. Yes. I appreciate it. This is going to be fun. So Alec, easy question for you first. What are you doing for fun right now? For fun? Pickleball. Pickleball? That's yep. a pretty something new, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, actually, pickleball was invented in Bainbridge, of all places. I had no clue about that. Yeah. Some people are pretty religious about it. Like, Especially Bainbridge. They'll, they'll start um, on the side of the court that's closest to Bainbridge, you know, kind of like a Mecca, where you got to pray towards the direction of Mecca. I had no you clue know? it was Bainbridge. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, actually, is named after a dog named Pickle. So that's where the pickle comes from. <laughs> oh, wow. I had no yeah. clue. I'm really excited to go uh, backpacking this year. I mean, we, we live in one of the really the most beautiful nature areas in the world, I think. It's like the, the American Alps out here. Um, and I tried fly fishing for the first time a few weeks ago, hoping to get some more of that in. Have you have you gone deep sea deep sea fishing? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. My cousin owns a, uh, he produces carbon fiber rods, Okay. edge rods. Um, and so he, he has a charter that, that goes out and tests out his rods. We went last year for cod and halibut and you, it was, you, you got a westport or you go somewhere else uh where do we go out of it was close to westport um it was i forgot the name of the city but it was between uh it was on the columbia delta on okay. the washington side though so funny story i used to go dc fish every year i went seven times right you know, with my son different friends whatever case to be different people all the time the first four times it didn't matter what i ate what i drunk you yep. know i was like perfect right nothing at all Last three times, they're like this. I couldn't stand it, right? So la the third time, like, I can't do this no more. I'm done, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's the same for us. I mean, we, we took the Dramamine. We had the bands. But still, at the hour and a half going out and the hour and a half coming back in was, like, really rough. The hour and a half going in, is, going out is, like, fucking oof, brutal sometimes. But then, I mean, the, the hour that we're fishing, oh, yeah, no fine. matter how much, yeah, you, it's you're, fine, yeah. it's, it's awesome. You're just, like, you know, pulling them out, the giant fish, having a good time. But then, is it worth it? That's That's hard. Yeah. So here's a, here's a story for I've said on podcast before. So one time we were in DC fishing. Of course, you know, so you have to be getting by five, you know, so you have to leave pretty early. And the boat leaves at six, right? Because, you know, you bring coolers, bring beer, whatever, whatever. Yep. And so one time we was on there, these two old dudes, right? They had to be like the 60s, 70s, right? And they're like, they look sea, what's the word? C1, right? You can tell they live the whole life in the sea, right? Uh -huh. They had this big ass cooler, right? Like, what the fuck they got, right? And so you go, there's like, so boat leaves at six, like 6 30, the one old guy's the other one. You think we can start now? We should have started at five in the morning. Like, <laughs> and so six thirty, I swear, and they put out the, the, a gun of the water and a case of Schaefer Light. They were done at seven thirty. What a.m. a.m. <laughs> they killed it. They killed it. Oh my and god! I, and what? They caught ninety percent of the fish. <laughs> <laughs> All the fish like fucked to them. Like, what the fuck's going on, right? Like, they're the fish were screws. Because they baited their hook a little bit in the wild turkey, yeah. probably. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but that, I, that, I saw the wild turkey, so I was done for the whole day. I spent the whole day in the in the bed that night. I was like, I just, I couldn't take it, right? Uh, so many bad memories for wild turkey. Yeah, deep sea fishing, man. It's a lot of fun, though. Yeah, when the when the weather is nice. Oh, yeah, when the weather is nice, yeah. When, like, salmon fish, especially, right? Yeah. Well, I've never done salmon in the deep sea. Yeah. Um, But salmon in the Puyallup River? When the when the run's going, oh my god, that's so much fun! Yeah, you got ten thousand people in the river. Everybody's thirty feet apart, but you're still catching the limit if you know, want right? to. Yeah, that's why I've never done that. I need. To, I've never done done in the. Pyotr. I think it's going on this year. 
I didn't, I didn't do that. So the thing I like to do in deep sea fish and salmon is like they just they go everywhere under the boat, over the boat, or like just so it's like it's a adventure, not adventure, but you know, it's like a more interesting. Yeah, you're not like waiting hours to get no, a bite or whatever. No. I, that, that's and you get a bite, you know, you have a bite. Yeah, I tried. I told you I tried fly fishing for the first time this year. It's so much more fun than you know the the traditional sitting there waiting for the bob to yeah waiting for the some something to happen yeah he's like that kind of feel, well I drink a six pack time to move yeah exactly but you know when I was I couldn't help but thinking that fly fishing is kind of like the the uh, approved man's man version of ribbon dancing oh yeah yeah because <laughs> you, you know you're you're twirling that thing out there it's so much fun but um, no one's laughing at you because because. <laughs> No, you fly fishing. <laughs> so, um, you did a YouTube talk like six years ago, right? TEDx talk, yeah. So, I, I don't, I'm not sure if you like, if like some people read the comments, some people I don't know if you read the comments or not. Oh yeah. But I found this one comment. I just fucking laugh, right? Um, someone, someone said this about you. This guy got high watching the Matrix, and then someone gave him a TED talk. <laughs> Yeah, I got roasted in the comments, and uh, I, I mean, deservedly. Um, I thought it was so funny. This dude got hired, watched on Matrix, and I came with TED Talk. Like, <laughs> like, like, is that easy to get a talk, TED Talk, right? Well, uh, actually, what's interesting about that TEDx talk was um, it was at my my university in, uh, actually, I was in St. Petersburg, Russia at the time. And uh, all the spots except for one were filled by like, you know, physicists, computer scientists, founders, entrepreneurs. And then they had one spot reserved for a student. So they held a public speaking competition, whole uh, school was invited, and I ended up winning that. So they allowed me to speak. But the funny part was that my talk did better than everyone else's. Um, I think it's like close to 330,000 views or so. Yeah, probably because you was like more authentic. Other people that are probably trying to sell something. Oh, I'm a professor of this. I'm a doctor of this. Let me show how... Um great I am you know I think I think people are generally really interested in the idea that everything around us is a computer program but for the mainstream audience there's no one who can deliver it in a accessible way you know in a way that people are um, able to understand there's a lot of computer science physics and technical things that go into simulation theory but my my whole role was to try to um, expose the idea in a way that is suitable for like a mass audience. So when you, when you gave your TED talk and you said, you know, we're in a simulation, can, can you tell all audience like, who's this fucking crazy motherfucker? Like, <laughs> or, or, or were we receptive to that? They were like, okay, here's another fucking crackhead talking some bullshit. Well, I mean, I think, um, you know, what's the alternative? We, we kind of, um, as, as human beings, we kind of like can't help but to wonder sometimes. And we, we have all of these uh, traditions, these historical teachings, science and religion but nobody really knows. So there's still room for speculation and people love being told a story if it's good enough. I guess my, my story came through in a good way. Yeah. And so you was at St. Petersburg University in Russia when you did that? Yes. So I have to ask, your, your speech in is English, right? I would have thought I'd been in Russian or something like yeah. that. So the TED Talks, everyone in English, I guess? or No, I think most of the rest of them were in Russian there. And usually when, when the TEDx is done, you know, at a, in, a, in a foreign location, um, there'll, there'll be some English or maybe mostly English, depending on the place. Uh, and then some in the, the native languages as well. Are you going to do any more TED talks? I hope so. That'd be fun. What was the process? I mean, cause I know someone else who gave one and that I know the process is easy. You just can't like put your name in the hat. You're like, there's a process to it, right? Can you explain the process of getting approved to do a TED talk? Yeah. So, uh, for, for this particular one, um, there was a public speaking contest. So you had to give your talk first in front of an audience and a jury and, uh, once they decided, you know, the most impactful or however they they judged, um, then you were to take that talk and then refine it further. Um, you want to work with someone who will help you fine tune the talk and the presentation the slides. There was a lot of preparation went into it. I probably spent about 80 hours uh, practicing and refining before I gave that talk. So now. How's it work? I suppose you have your own speaking style, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, people say it works for you, whatever, you're natural. And the, and the coach says, no, change it up. Like, you have to do what the TEDx coach says. You got to keep it to yourself. How's that work? Well, I mean, um, there was general guidelines for us, but nothing like really specific. You have to change all of this and um, you you have to add this or take this away. So there, the the kind of feedback from the coaches was more uh, general. So I had a lot of room to play. Um, but I think, you know, when you're giving a TEDx talk, 
it has to like this is your your moment in the spotlight so you you want to put in as much energy as you can to make it great so what benefits do you get either personally or professionally for doing the TEDx talk what, what's the benefit of doing one uh, I get to put it on my LinkedIn. I get to talk about it for, I, I hope, the rest of my life, um, or at least until I do an, another one. And uh, I, there's been some really interesting people that have reached out to me through uh, seeing my TEDx talk, reach out to me on LinkedIn and, and different social media platforms. Uh, I remember this one guy who he messaged me on LinkedIn. He said, thank you so much. Um, you know, I got a lot of different kinds of comments people were rightfully so trashing me. I'm not a computer scientist. I'm not a physicist. I just tried to convey these ideas in a, in a simple way. But one guy, he reached out to me and he said, you know, I was, um, I was having some real issues with depression and I watched your talk. And I realized if we're living in a game, I just, I just got to play the game. I just have to let go of all of this, you know, stress rat race and focus on uh, getting a high score. That means something to me, you know? And he he was saying that it helped him with his, anxiety and his social uh, depression, things like that. So that was really impactful and powerful for me. Yeah. Um, so you know, talk about metaverse, different universes, right? You yeah. Know, like, you know, to my mind, there's like, there's, de there's definitely different worlds, right? You know, if you're like, you know, a bourbon maker, you're in the world of bourbon, right? Yeah. If you're a startup, you're in the world of startups, you're a science, you're the, there's all these different worlds, right? I and mean, universes, right? You make your own universe, I think, right? So like, you know, simple, like, you know, do you go left or right? You know, all these simple decisions you make, like you wanted to like, Either one of us go right now say, I'm tired of this shit and let's go live in some small town in, in the South and, you know, do nothing. Right. Right. So I think there's a lot of these metaverses out there. It's, and then it's like the stuff going on now, like, like recently, like I said, pre-talk told you it's like the universe has background music. They did pull from gravitational waves. Like, first of all, the hell the gravitational waves, you know, like, <laughs> and then like these people really know what they're talking about, right? Or are they just making shit up, right? Do you, do you really know? No, like. Hey, I'm the kind of person who I don't know for sure until I'm there myself or until I'm like, you know, running the tests myself. Um, so I, I've always got doubts and I think doubts are healthy. Um, we're trying to understand the universe as humans. And I think there's there's always going to be charlatans and storytellers and, and people who, who like to exaggerate. And then there's always going to be people who try to um, uh, uh, things with science as much as they can and, and tell a story with yeah. science. But Oftentimes, you know, when, when you're, when, when the researchers are looking at the cosmos, there's a lot of numbers and math yeah. and how do you tell a story out of that? So, um, you have really good storytellers like Neil Tyson deGrasse, who, yeah, who's who, great at that. Right. Who, who can turn numbers into something that's beautiful and moving. emotional and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And like, you know, with the James Webb telescope finding many, like hundreds of thousands of new galaxies every day, like, I mean, I know a lot of people say there's no, 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 no life out there, but how can, how can there not be right? I mean, that's statistically impossible i think but who knows right you know what's really interesting though so uh there there's a movie called the 13th floor um i don't know if you've heard of it or seen it it's a, one of the early ones about simulation theory actually before the matrix i think i think it was 98 that it came out and the idea is i don't want to spoil it there, there might be some spoilers so if you want to watch it close your ears <laughs> um the idea is that there there's a company uh that creates a simulation of los angeles in the 30s and when they go into the simulation, they take over one of the characters. So what was really interesting is that at the edge of the simulation, it stopped rendering. Uh, so, so when they got to the edge of the simulation, there was just a whole bunch of uh, uh, lines and graphs and uh, th there weren't any like beautiful colors or textures. Um, but, you know, if you have a flat simulation at a certain point, you have to stop because your processing power just runs out. But if you have a sphere, then there is no edge. So you can create a completely enclosed space. So every time I Rick and Morty before he started, and, and there's an episode when that happens, right? During simulation and, and Rick's like, we just have to get to the edge and jump off. Yep. Or the whole episode, we got to find the edge and jump off. Right. Like, you find, they, two or three times you, find, you thought you found the edge, like, no, still the simulation. Like, fuck. So they're not find the award. They finally, but finally they found the edge and then they got out. Yeah, right. So, I mean, the, the idea is if we're, if we're on a sphere now, if, if, if this planet is a sphere, this is some people argue against that, of course, yeah, you know, yeah. but uh, the idea is there's no edge. So you, you, there's no real way to find out. Yeah. So if we are in simulation, what do you think the purpose of simulation is? Like, why would someone even want to start a simulation? There's all sorts of reasons for it. I mean, um, the, the top one being entertainment, the top one being creating experience where 
you can do things that you can't do in your real life, you know? Like why do we play GTA or or Assassin's Creed um, in a world where you can die and kill endlessly, you know, where you can do forbidden things without consequences? Yeah. That's kind of, I think, one of the one of the most compelling ideas behind simulations. So do you think there's one person running the simulation? It's like a group project? No. So there's hundreds of thousands of simulations going on at the same time? Look, man, in the AI age, I think it's it's abundantly clear that if we're living in a simulation, it was designed by an AI. It was um, kind of like put through a bunch of trial and error. And this AI is fine tuning all of the constants of life, you know, Planck's constant and the gravitational constant until it gets something right where um, we're in a space where humans can can exist. So how, how old is AI? Like when did AI start? Do you happen to know? I mean, it, it depends on how you look at it. I, I don't have... Um, like the official history off the top like of my head. Pretty recent though, right? Yeah. So you have to think that this is a AI. It has to be someone not of Earth, right? Because like, it has to be someone like way far advanced of us in some kind of other like alien technology, right? Yeah, it's hard to say. I don't know. I mean, uh, if we, if we, this is a simulation and there's a quote unquote real world or as Elon Musk called it, like a base reality, yeah. right? It could be so much different than what we're experiencing now that we don't even have a frame well, maybe of understanding. This is actually the year 200, and we think it's the year 2023, right? right? Maybe we are like fucking small chips in our head, like, you know, those, like on the Star Wars, the clone troopers, right? Yeah, exactly. That's some crazy shit. Yeah, it's fun to think about. It is, right? And then, like, there's so many possibilities, right? Simulation on a simulation, you know, like, yep. what is, like, there's, like, five people doing simulation. Each one is, like, their own specialty, right? Yep. Like, suppose one's in control of the weather, but that person actually dies, right? Oh, shit, the weather's all fucked up now. The simulation guy's not here, right? <laughs> yeah. Or he's just taking a vacation. <laughs> uh, no. Yeah. Um, what got you interested in the simulation theory? Uh, I'm, uh, movies, honestly. Uh, if you, in my in my TEDx talk, uh, I mentioned a few of the, the top ones that really piqued my interest. Matrix is obviously on there. The 13th Floor, which I was just talking about recently, is also on there. Uh, the Truman Show. Uh, and, and another one, Dark City, which is just really impactful. Have you seen the Truman Show? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think- uh, You see this, this guy, like, what is, what's this? Yeah. Right. And I, and I open up. I think it's um, it's archetypal, kind of, you know, where I think every human being has this little inkling of doubt about yeah. our experience. And when, when there's a movie that really effectively and uh, in a compelling way exposes that doubt, it's it's a powerful experience for us. Especially like you have deja vu, right? Yeah. Okay, like I've never done this, but it sure does feel like I've done this before. Right, right. right. And, and you probably have done it some sometime before. Yeah. And yeah. that's where the uh, what's it called? The um reincarnation stuff comes in and stuff, you know. Yep. Yep. So is there like a scientific theory behind simulation theory? Well, I know that there are um people who who do a much better job of going into the computer science and the physics behind uh, how and why simulation theory could be right. But uh, the, the problem, the biggest problem behind simulation theory is that being inside of a simulation, it's really difficult to determine whether or not this is one. Yeah. Um, and there, there's a lot of science that goes into trying to understand what the universe is, I'm talking quantum mechanics, physics, and um, computer science also. Yeah, I definitely want to talk quantum computing later on. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of science that goes into kind of the speculation behind simulation hypothesis. Um, and there's a lot of people who try, uh, scientists who who speak about simulation hypothesis um, using scientific terms uh, about how we could go about proving it. But we run into a really big problem where we can't really falsify it, right? Yeah. There, there's if we're inside a simulation and the simulation is designed for us not to know that it's a simulation, it's pretty difficult to tell. Yeah. Yeah. I know a lot of people talking about all the aliens out there want aliens to come see us. I'm like, do we really want an alien to come see us? Right. For <laughs> example, like it's a bad analogy, but way back in the day, 1400s, Cortez went to Spain, went to the Incas, pretty much destroyed all the Incas, right? Thought he was a god, right? Yeah. I mean, can you imagine some alien coming here and like, not being like, you know, and being hostile, like we would have no, like we would like, we would all be slaves, right? Like, yeah, pretty much. I mean, I think it's interesting though, because the the Maya and the Aztecs, their legends talk about white men with beards mm -hmm. as gods, you yeah. know, and these guys came for yeah. literally fulfilling a prophecy. You know what? I have, <laughs> I have a theory too, right? So if you're an alien, what's the easiest way to, to like conquer the earth? 
And we're assuming that your alien has some kind of power, right? So you send one alien. Yeah, he has to say he can levitate, do some powerful stuff. Uh -huh. And he says, I'm God. I'm the God of Abraham, blah, blah, blah. Yep. And half the world's going to worship and instantly other half are like, this is bullshit. Yep. And like maybe they file a nuclear weapon and just throws it away, right? That's all you got to do. Just come here with some, a lot of power and say, I'm God. It's like, I think it's a done deal. What's crazy is um, the, the Sumerian mythology talks about uh, their gods as Anunnaki, mm -hmm. they, which, which came to Earth and actually did the whole like gene spacing thing, allegedly, right? There's, there's a guy named Zachariah Sitchin um, who wrote a lot of, of books on this topic. Uh, he says he was translating text. Other people are saying it's more pseudoscience, that he's kind of being loose and fast. Uh, with, with the translation, but the the general idea is that these alien beings came to Earth looking for gold, and uh, basically um, took some of their DNA, spliced it with primates to create humans as a slave species yeah. that would mine their gold for them. I mean, there's some crazy stories. I like um, one one the kind of theory is that you know, like back in the day, apes were on all fours. Then they started doing mushrooms, and you know, yeah. and that enlightened them. You know, right. I mean, so many theories out there, right? And then, like, you know, like, not to talk religion, but, you know, you know, talking about God, right? There's so many gods, right? Mm -hmm. I can think Ricky Gervais, he's like a famous atheist, right? Yep. And somebody said, why, you, why do you believe in God? He's like, there's 10,000 gods. I just happen to believe in one less God than you do. So what's the difference, right? <laughs> and like, you know, like, is, is a God of the Norse gods, the Greek gods, you know? It's, it's like, and then, like, on one hand, you have, like, religious people, like, you know, God created everything, right? Okay. The story's good and all, but scientific factual, I don't know if it works out right, but it's a great story or whatever, right? And there's so many creation stories ever, right? On the other hand, with a scientist, I'm like, okay, you're telling me two atoms pop together and create everything. I don't know if I got to know who they're right. Like, it has to be a third option out there, like, makes more sense, right? Yeah, I think I think what's really interesting about that is, uh, so religion, there's, there's two different kind of parts of it that are really important. The one part is how you live your life and the good that it does to yeah. you and behavior, social interaction, yeah. cohesion, all that stuff. And then there, there's another part where you try to fulfill that seed of doubt that every human yeah. has about why we're here, what yeah. we're doing. Um, and people who, who argue really strongly for it kind of don't really sound that smart sometimes. Yeah. But what's more interesting is now in the age of AI, right? When you can type into chat GPT any question you want, it boom, you know, it, it works through billions of nodes to give you an answer that's like right yeah. spot on. Uh, where you can imagine somebody building an AI and say, you know, typing in, let there be light. Yeah. And the AI handles all the hard work, makes an entire universe, yeah. tests through a bunch of different, you know, constants, and suddenly boom, there's light. Yeah. And back in the early day, like suppose you're early man, right? You need a long cloth, you whatever. And like you're kind of rich, and people are stealing your sheep and goats, whatever. What, what's <laughs> better way like having to stop to say, God says to do this right? Yeah. And like, you know, it's not like God always talked like one person, right? Right. You would think like I'll probably get fucking go to hell for saying this because I am Roman Catholic. But you would think like you know like God would like speak to everyone, right? Mm -hmm. I'm your God, like some kind of mass telephysis, whatever you want to call it, right? Or you always some random dude, some random shepherd, you know, by a burning bush, you know. Yep. Of course. Some people theorize it, it was a burning bush, but the dude's an, like the dude was an LSD or something, right? Right. It's always these theories, right? I mean, as a, to me, as a story, the Bible has to be the greatest story ever told, right? Because it's definitely like forty-five different stories, you know. It's different, and then get the New Testament, and it's it's just it's, it's just interesting to talk about, right? And then again, but I'm like, you're telling me small, two small items bang together, and it's like that's easy created. I don't know if I'll buy that either, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the most important things behind any religion is is like uh, creating rules that society will follow for the benefit of society, mm -hmm. right? If you if you say if God tells you don't eat pigs or don't eat shrimp, mm -hmm. there's like maybe some underlying reason yeah. where if you're doing that in the desert, maybe you'll get sick. Yeah, and probably, it's probably it's not good start, for yeah. you. Um, and <laughs> and so there's there's that part of it where you know that that social rule creating behaviors that are good for long. Yeah. Um, long, for the long run in societies, yep. right? So, but then again, like, do, should we really be following rules from somebody who was like wearing a long cloth thousands of years ago? You know, <laughs> like, you know, I don't know. And then, like, a lot of stuff in the Bible, too. Like, like I know in the old test, you couldn't eat pork or that kind of stuff. And the new test, a lot of people think like Jesus got rid of wasn't Jesus. It's like, supposing the Bible story is like an angel came to, to Paul and like, and they said, hey, don't worry about, you know, unclean eating. It, what comes out of your mouth makes you clean, like makes you dirty and nasty. It will put you in your mouth, right? So yeah, it's like a lot of that stuff. Like this for convenience sake, right? 
Yeah. What's interesting about the New Testament, I don't know if you've heard about this. Uh, there's this, uh, maybe it's a conspiracy theory. Maybe it's kind of like, um, you know, speculative research. Some people are saying that the, the New Testament was partly in part created by the Flavians, the Roman emperors who were, who were trying to like, I mean, cause the gospel written like 400 years after the people live. Right. 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 Well, I, I know you can pass stories down a generation, but something gets lost in translation. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, you know, you have this, this uh, prophecy about the Jewish temple getting destroyed yeah. and then you have this emperor who comes in and does it with the emperor had a lot of relationships yeah. with Jews. But the other thing about relations, uh, religion is that um, if it doesn't resonate with people, it's never going to get adopted. Yeah. There must be something about uh, Christianity that really resonated with Europeans and, and that part of the world where, you know, they, they, a lot of people felt that this is right. This must be the truth because this is how I feel inside. Yeah. I, I definitely think that Roman Empire, I co-opted it, right? Because this, this is a great story. So this, I can show it. So this, this tattoo here. Cairo. Yeah. So the, for those who know, the story was Constantine was in a, about to have a battle. I think it was a civil war. He's outnumbered out everything. Right. Yep. And then supposedly, allegedly this was, this appeared in the sky and Jesus said with this symbol conquer. Right. Right. And then so he painted all, all the all the all the shows and stuff that conquered, beat his ass, beat the enemy's ass, whatever. And then Constantine became emperor again, and then the Roman Empire became Christian, right? Right. And of course, then they put brought in like you know some pagan holidays, like a sun holiday, yep. combined Christians, right? So like, I think like they, I think for political purposes they co-opted Christianity, right? Yeah. And know some people are like, oh, it's, that's not you know that's not bad. A lot of Christians will say, well, that we might agree the way it became like the world religion, but he, this guy does a great service, right? Without him, the whole world would not be Christian today, at least most of the world, right? I think uh, I think there's a lot to be said about uh, the idea that you create common language between different regions where suddenly, you know, if you're French and somebody else is Hungarian or German, you can't really understand each other. And whenever you meet as travelers on the road, there's automatically suspicion. Yeah. But if you're both Christian, if you both identify as Christian, the common bond, suddenly you there's see, like, you see a cross somewhere or, right. you know, yeah. Suddenly there's like this level of trust where um, you can, you can have this framework for being able to pass each other on the road without violence. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, and, and, and think what kind of part you got as a person, right? You, you remember part, you just, you just do a decree. We're all, we're all Catholic now. Yeah. Everyone takes their sun gods and the gods or whatever, and like throw it away, you know? Right. I, I, so can you imagine if someone came here from the Roman Empire right now and like, where's, where's the God or whatever, right? Like, we, we, they're like, you, you, what Christianity is the thing? Like we used to crucify them jokers back in the day. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I think uh, people would be in for a big surprise. But at the same time, I mean, maybe there's something to it where yeah, I mean, suddenly they get it. They're like, this makes sense. Give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, yeah. right? Where... Make sure you pay your taxes. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. And this may relate to like, you know, I mean, of course, every knows your, your relationship is really based on like where you're born and what your parents do. That's true. I mean, like if you're born a family like in Rome, Italy, the odds of you being Islam is like pretty, pretty low, right? Yes. Like if you're born like, you know, in Saudi Arabia or Iran, you know, chance of you being Christian or Jewish is like pretty low too, you know? Right. So that plays a lot too. I mean, religion is good. It does serve a purpose, you know? Of course, they always say, who's a better person? The religious person doing good deeds because he wants to go to a better place, or the atheist who just does good deeds because he's a good person, you know. Yep. That's a really good philosophy question, I think. Well, you're Roman Catholic, you said, yep. right? Do you do you have a like a conviction about your faith, or is it more like traditions? Uh so my my grand my uh, we we're Roman Catholics in generations, right? Mm -hmm. I even have the picture when I got uh Christian or baptized when I was a little kid, you know. Mm -hmm. Like the guy who baptized me actually still works at the, the church, you know. Okay. So plus the work my grandmother doing it, you know, like a lot of tradition, right? Yeah. A lot has a good tradition, right? Which can For be sure. good and bad, right? You know. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's uh, you know, I had my 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 father is actually a pastor in a church. I had my rebellious phase for sure, but now I've kind of, you know, come to see um that 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 organization that he's running is filled with really good people that yeah um really care about community and have good values that i respect so um there's you know when you get a little bit older you kind of see see things yeah with a different different light i guess where the community is more important yeah. at a certain and our relations have like black marks right you know like freaking you know the back in the day crack of church they uh they were like paying people were paying to, to get into heaven you know they're doing yep. good things of course 
all these fucking, you know, horrible people, priests, like, having sex with little boys, yeah. like, in the cover with that. That's fucking, like, I don't know how that even happened, right? Like, and they wonder why so many people live in the Roman Catholic Church, right? Like, look, yeah. look you're supporting, right? And of course, you know, it, when Islam started, it was like, you know, I wrote a book a long time ago, I think it's called The Conquest of Islam, right? Where basically, you go to town, put the sword in your neck, convert yep. or die. Well, I guess I'm, 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 I'm praying in I'm Mecca. Muslim now. I guess I'm praying in Mecca four times a day. <laughs> yeah. I want to live, right? Yeah. Yeah, so many people have been dying in the new religion, right? For sure, for sure. And then, you know, like, some of your new religions pop out. Scientology is like, right. I think it's like, so many gods, some of your religions, it's like, insane. Uh, so do you ever watch, watch, watch South Park? Oh, yeah. He says one episode where like all these people died at one time and they're like, like they were in hell, right? They were like, what are you doing in hell? Like I was a, I was the best, whatever, best Christian based, whatever, like South of the Baptist, Presbyterian, Luther, I was the best, whatever. Like, what the hell? Oh, you didn't pick the right religion. What? What's the right religion? <laughs> the answer is Mormons. Mormons? <laughs> How is that the right religion? They started in the 1800s. There's no way that's the right religion. Yeah, it's, it's Mormonism. We moved, we, we moved from this one to Mormonism. We change religions every hundred years up, up here. <laughs> it's like it's like y'all playing restaurant roulette with your with your eternal life. <laughs> well, like, well, who knows, right? It's like like another like meme on on I think it was on Facebook somewhere. They're like you know, so like Christian, they go like you know, evangelize. They find a person, you know, is Jesus Christ saved? Who's Jesus Christ? Or you believe in Jesus, you'll be forever, you know, saved, right? Mm. But after you, but after you, Jesus saved, you can do no more wrong, like. But so before you tell me about Jesus, are we going to heaven because of ignorance, right? Yeah. Why the fuck are you talking about Jesus Christ? <laughs> just, let, just let me live my life. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll be sure. saved afterwards, right? Yeah. Like, like, what are you doing to me? I think, uh, I think at a certain point, you know, when in the ancient times, you've got like, there are no rules. There, there are no necessarily like morals. And, and even today, <laughs> Right. If you hit someone in the face, it's bad. But if you're defending your daughter, it's yeah. good. Yeah. You know, it's the same thing where you need to come up with a set of rules where people aren't killing each other and your, yeah. your society is growing. There's constant competition with different tribes. So you got to find a way for, for your tribe to kind of like yeah. carve its place under the sun. Um, so that was really important. But now, you know, we're in this like age where all information is <laughs> available at your fingertips yeah. any second of the day. And yeah, it's it's really interesting thing, thinking about what are we what are we gonna move into next? Like yeah. how are we gonna structure our society? So what are the values that we're gonna need to like emphasize? Yeah. And what's the saying? Everyone's an atheist until something bad happens and they gotta pray to something. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know? Yep. Yeah. It's it's crazy. I mean, like, well, who knows, right? It's like so many unlimited possibilities, you know, like it's it's just insane. Like so much knowledge now, like. There was a study, there was a study, I, I don't remember exactly which university put it on, but they created a fake guru. Um, and it was, you know, completely intentional, where the this person was was chosen for this specific experiment. And um, over three months, this fake guru gathered a following of, you know, I think it was like 50 to 100 people. Um, and completely pretending to be this guru, uh, this spiritual leader and, and you know, kind of fooling these people along the way. And after a certain point, I think it was so, that the study, the point of it was that this guru said that I'm doing this for an experiment. You're part of an experiment. I'm not really this person. And yet there's a certain percentage of They're his followers follow that continue to follow that religion. I mean, people are so, are so gullible, right? It's proven time and again that most people want to be led, right? Yep. Most people are not leaders. They want like, you know, there would be like a like a routine every day. Do the same thing, go to work, make the bullshit money, come home, watch some TV, you know, drink their beer, and they're like follow any little thing. You know, like I mean, when COVID, pandemic was bad, but it proved like how gullible people are. Like they would just do every little thing. Like where this, where that, you know, no questions asked, right? You know, right? It's I don't know. So next question. Let's suppose there's someone we'll say from a year fifteen hundred, right? Mm -hmm. No, let's go back. To the Roman Empire time, right? Okay. We say the year 120. Well, let's say August Caesar Augustus Empire, right? You're saying that because your lady is here. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I love that. So they take someone of average challenge at that time and bring them to 2023. It takes someone of average challenge to 2023 and put them there and give each of them one month to get acclimated. Which one to be would be more successful? 
and take advantage of the opportunity. Right? And there's no like language barriers. No, no language barriers. No so language. automatically you can speak you, language. You give them 30 days, they like figure shit out, study stuff, you know how things work, you know. So, I mean, you're saying take the average person. I think it really it depends on a case by case, person by person basis. But still, I think that this person from the Roman Empire is going to have a lot more uh, luck here mm -hmm. because you just it's just so much harder to live back then. Yeah. Um, now we have, you know, indoor these, plumbing, everything's comfortable. Everything's yeah. easy. You want, you know, a, a new shirt. It's in the, it's on your doorstep the yeah. next, the next yeah. morning. You don't have to do anything for it. Yeah. And then you had to go kill a sheet, right? Go, make the clothes yourself. And you have this new generation that's never opened a map before. Mm -hmm. It's never used a map yeah. to get anywhere. Um, and, and, you know, you have every single, like, like I said, all the knowledge of the universe or of earth at your fingertips available in an instant yeah um and you know just just using google maps as an example like you just type in an address and you're ready to go yeah but people you know even 30 40 years ago yeah. used to people just, don't realize like electricity is, is relevant in the, in the history of the world electricity is a pretty new thing indoor plumbing is a pretty good new thing right yep i mean 100 years ago people like you know using outhouses right and dying from yeah. from really diseases that we can't even fathom anymore no in in especially in the western world like what's diphtheria or, or cholera yeah. like what what are those things yeah, i think some of them i'm like you i think some of them from back in the day would come and just fucking dominate yeah they would just dominate once you figured it out how stuff works and stuff you know like okay i can do this i can do that like yeah i think back in the day you kind of you had to like you had to do anything you could to make yeah. it work yeah plus back in the day like once the sun went down like I'm sure you had like lanterns and lamps you know mm -hmm. fire sticks but like the reason there was no working after right. after dark right right Nope. And if you're out after dark, then it's dangerous. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Criminals, robbers, animals, you know. All like, that good stuff. Yeah. Which makes the Roman Empire even more impressive to me, right? They were able to control all that shit back in those days, right? Yeah. Oh, by the way, I don't do you have your followers seen your Gladius? Can I hold it up? Yeah. For him? Yeah. Yeah. Let me let me hold no. this thing up. This thing is awesome. Look at this. Yeah. So this is a gift <laughs> for my brigade command left the left brigade this one job in the army. Yeah. This he, is sweet. He used to give all his staff offers this right here. So cool. Yeah. And for those of you who have seen my tattoos, I actually have that on tattoo on my left, my right leg too. It's pretty nice, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's interesting, like you no know, comparing like different generations, different time frames. You know, like like to me, like I'm like you, like you leave it right now. Some ask you, do you want to like go 100 years in the future, 100 years in the back? Like I want to stay here, right? Like, but 100 yeah. years from now, the world might be blown up, nuclear dis exactly. disaster. 100 years ago, I ain't, I, fuck, I ain't doing that shit. You know, yeah. I mean, you could have made some money, uh, but at the same time, like we, it's it's nice here. It's nice now. It's, yeah, it's a, of course. You know, that's a bad thing too. Like, what's the saying? Um, I can't I always say this. Good times make yeah, uh, soft men. Yeah. Soft men make bad times. Bad yeah. times make hard men, or something. So like we're that. in the we're in the like the worst cycle of that right now. Yeah, think you know. So yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Looking at kids, um, how how they're like. You know, as soon as they have diapers on, they're just stuck in a smartphone. Yeah. How's that? How's that going to work? I was just, uh, I was just talking with somebody about how executives from Apple and from Facebook have come on publicly saying they'll never let their kids touch their product. Yeah. yeah. Never. You know, uh, it, they, they make it to be addicting. That's part of the design process. Is this device is supposed to be grabbing your attention, um, and it works really well, especially for kids who have no defenses against yeah. it. So yeah, speaking of and when parents use it as a babysitting mechanism, yeah. it's even fucking worse. Yeah, and then th the thing is, once you you know uh, remove that, mm -hmm. then they got withdrawals. Yeah, they start they start you know bawling and crying and and I know. like yeah, it's it's like uh, you know, coming off of a of a drug. Yeah, basically it is. Yeah, the kids they're defenseless. They have no idea what what what's going on. And and, and kids nowadays like so. Very kids have what they call like that dog in right? Like that desire to do better, right? Right. Very few. The one, a few of them do, and of course, a few that are like dogs, so to speak, like really like go-getters, they just shine so much of other people, right? It's not even close. You just, okay, you're going to do something with your life. Yep. And there's other people like just doing, like, what are you doing, right? Yeah. 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 So, I, I mean, speaking of values and what we need to like prioritize and emphasize going forward, what do we need to focus on as a society? Mm -hmm. I think we need to reconnect back in the real world you know, and kind of make sure that we're incentivizing people to have real experiences and engagement. And then like people always talk about, they need to teach this in school, that in school, right? right. You know, it's, well, Taxes, okay. finance, or, or, computer or, science. Okay, the only school for sales hours a day, how do you propose they 
learn all this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you got to learn math, science, you know. If you learn, I mean, they've been in school 24-7, right? Yeah. So how do you decide as a society what's really important, right? And what's what's the school's responsibility? What's the parent's responsibility, right? Is it really the school's responsibility to teach my kid how to balance a, pay, a, 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 a checkbook? Checkbook, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or is that on me? Yeah. So the school teach my kids how to fucking cook lasagna? Or is that on me, right? Yeah. Like, I don't know, like. I think it's how we, we try to put too much of our own responsibilities on, on other people, right? Mm -hmm. Then again, the verse is like, if I don't know how to balance a, a checkbook, how the hell am I teach my kids to balance a checkbook? Right. So it's a catch twenty two, right? Yep, exactly. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, we we. It's hard to say we need experimentation, mm -hmm. um, but I think I think there's certain things that can that can really. The other side of the coin is we're going into this future age, right, where kids are learning times tables, mm -hmm. but we, we have a calculator at our fingertips yeah. anytime. Do we really need that? Yeah, it's not like it's a wasted effort, you know, like wasted time to teach them, like teach them something better, like fucking teach them how to code, you know? Right, exactly. What do you think? I think, yeah, coding needs to be taught from a younger age. Like times tables, yeah, I don't know, right? I mean, cursive, like, I actually believe people still, still learn how to write cursive, you know? Just old fashioned like that. I think yeah. writing cursive has some, some like a value in it, you know? Mm -hmm. But it's, and then it's like, what values do you want? You know, like the school says one value, one parent has one value, another parent has one value. Like one parent were like, I want my kid to pay for every meal at school. Right. Other parent like, you know, well, that's fine and Danny, but I'm not Christian, right? I'm whatever, right? Right. This offends me, right? It's, yep. And there's like a the Supreme Court case recently where this high school coach, I think in Bremerton, was saying prayers after games and they took him to court. Supreme Court said, no, he can he can pray whatever he wants to if he's at work, right? Yeah. You know, and like the release, recent case this week where um this web designer didn't want to do web design for like a, a, a gay couple mm -hmm. and she won, you know? Yep. And then like, there's a case in Indiana where it's like a, a people are making wedding cakes in the same right. case. Right. Right. So that's, that's a case I thought with the Supreme court. So it's a different case. And like, I probably get blasted like this, but with me, like if you're like, whatever you are, right. Like me, I'm, I'm from Texas. I'm Republican, you know, I'm Roman Catholic. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, somebody said, hey, we're not going to buy, sell you this because you're from Texas. Mm. Thank you very much. I'm going to the next business. Yeah, thank you for not the meeting my money to support you, right? Yep. But then if other people are, no, we should be able to buy what we want to. It's, yeah, it, th those are complicated questions. Like, me personally, like, if I'm buying a cake from you and you don't like what I am, you're not fucking with my food. You're not making my no food for me, right? <laughs> like, like, you know? Yeah, I think I think have different different responses, I guess. When you force somebody to do something, it's going to be lower quality. Oh, yeah. I mean, maybe maybe you're right. Maybe there's 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 certain things that are done on principle, yeah. and I get that, you know. And you have to respect the United States for pushing the envelope on a lot oh, of yeah. things. No matter where people stand on the, the trans issue, it's um, the the idea of of respecting people, no matter who yeah. they are, that sets the U.S. apart from any other nation really yeah. on the planet. And most people here realize that. Yeah, they that's true. They don't realize that. And it it soaks through the the global consciousness. Yeah. And some of the stuff people say here about different people, they being judged different countries. Right. Right. I've traveled quite a bit in my life and you know, I've seen a lot of different things, but it seems like the um, a lot of American culture is is kind of being absorbed yeah. all over the world. Oh yeah. And probably for the better. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we've got consumerism here. We've got materialism here and maybe there's some negative things about about how we organize our capitalism yeah but uh in general it's probably not benefit. so i remember i was in the army for 25 years it just it was like it was like interesting i go to different countries like serve like my family they come like you know we hate america get out of here whatever but where they saying i hate america have a coca-cola shirt on yeah or they have you know a, a, a los Angeles lake jersey on right or something like some kind of something with american culture iconic american culture they're yep. right so you say we suck but you love our coca-cola yeah gotcha right yeah, are you driving cars that are produced on a production line? Yeah. And guess what? That was mostly an American invention, right? Yeah. Or um, all we're, sorts we're of... The, we're the country people love to hate. Yeah. Do you use the internet? Yeah. Guess what? That was uh, the American military. Yeah. <laughs> and you could argue the reason that Korea and Japan are such big economy because, like, we protected them all through the years, right? For, for the military defense industrial complex, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's there's no way that they would have developed no, like all, all the all the all the all the seafaring trade lanes across the United, across the world pretty much are protected by us, right? One yep. or the other, right? Yep, yep. That's true. That's true. That's you know, and and that's why people choose the dollar um, to to do their trade. And now we're kind of in this 
kind of really tumultuous period in in the globe where it's like what's the future of the dollar it's really yeah because didn't like think russia and some other countries try to do this a new currency mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah they were talking russia's do, trying to do all sorts of different things i don't think they know what the fuck they're trying to get out of the situation yeah. um that uh, the most interesting from you know my opinion they're they're looking at uh doing a commodity-backed currency where it's like the BRICS countries brazil russia yeah, India, BRICS, yeah. china south africa where they're they're trying to to do this kind of uh uh, global currency that you can redeem for gold, oil, wheat, and and hard commodities, that could be really interesting. Yeah, that could be really interesting. And I mean, yeah, there, <laughs> you can definitely say that the United States uses the, the dollar as a weapon. Oh yeah, no doubt. Um, so it makes sense as an influencer. Right. Right. I remember a time where, like, uh, I think the World Bank used to be like, like seventy five percent U.S. dollar, now it's down like fifty nine cents to the dollar something like that you know so it's like it keeps on going down and down and like i'm making this up i think they predict for 15 years we were like below 50 50 cents or whatever it is you know well i mean see the, the biggest problem i think that people don't don't even realize is now that we're hiking interest rates and interest rates are like much higher than they've been in, in quite a while suddenly we're over 30 trillion dollars in debt now and suddenly yeah. the budget right there's over half a trillion dollars that's going to pay interest because yeah. of the high interest rates. Yeah. They're, they're rolling over debt with higher interest rates that they've got to pay more money to service. That's, I think, a really, really big danger. Um, I think, for, like, you're right, too many generations were like, oh, we'll just pass on the generation. Too many time, there's going to be time when you can't pass it on no more, right? Yeah. Like, and you, we're, as a country, I think it's, it's, not, it's going to time where we're going to come, like, we're going to have to, like, suck it up and go from eating ribeye steaks every day to eating baloney sandwiches every day to yep. kind of get back ahead of the game, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're in a really interesting position uh, in the United States. I think with with the the Federal Reserve, our central bank, it doesn't just create currency for America; it creates dollars for the whole world. I like, know, the whole right? world needs them. Yeah, and that's been a really interesting experiment. Talk about a powerful position. Yeah, that's yeah. a real powerful position. Yeah, but then again, I mean, if you if you look back through history, there's plenty of charts out there that talk about how this reserve currency status usually gets changed up about every hundred years or so yeah. we're coming right up on on that you yeah know. that's a good point so, i know i think it was richard nixon who took us off the gold standard right. so i don't know if that that's a good thing or bad thing you know if we had a reason but man i don't know yes what would you take on like uh like bitcoin that kind of stuff yeah this yeah, it was just so i i worked for a uh, crypto vc for a little while i didn't i wasn't on their investment team that was the M- smc capital. smc capital yeah so SMC Capital uh, bought tokens and then sold them for more Bitcoin and, and made some money that way. Um, and what was really interesting, having kind of an inside look in that ecosystem and that space, there's two camps, the way I see it. There's this um, like idealistic, driven, um, philosophically driven camp where people are really focused on decentralization and privacy and creating a future that uh, there's sovereignty for the individual. Um, and then there's the speculators, the scammers, the profiteers, the people who are who, who don't care about philosophy. They just care about flipping and making a dollar at whatever expense to anybody else. It's like really two completely different sides of, of the coin. It's like the dark side of the moon and the light side of the moon. It's it's uh, diametrically, it seems diametrically opposed. Um, and, and there's some things that I really vibe with, with the philosophy. Yeah. Like uh, people should be sovereign. We should all take control yeah. of our finances and take control of, of how we store our wealth, how we store our data and um, how we do business. All, all of those things are like... The, they, they, the the Bitcoin community, some of them are advocating that there should be a revolution in those things. That we need to grow as a species and be more spiritually mature. Uh, and and yet and yet, being on the inside, I saw how you have these certain funds that get together in Telegram groups and say we're buying this today, and we're selling at three p.m. Mm-hmm. So get ready, and they move the market that way. And um, somebody who who thinks they can make money. And uh, not really making money and kind of getting the short end of the stick because it was rigged. Um, so it, it it's hard to put it, con, you know, congest that down into into one single opinion. But I don't know. What do you think? I mean, it's not like Bitcoin is like on one note, it's like Bitcoin is like this fantasy 
you know, um, currency out there, like for rich people, whatever case. But I remember one time I actually got my barber, and my barber said, hey, I, I take Bitcoin now. Like, oh, shit. That's not hitting. Like, okay, maybe this is more mainstream than I thought I was, right? Yeah. My barber's taking Bitcoin as payment. Okay, maybe this is more. And of course, I think you had El Salvador made the like, national currency, right? You right. know? Yep. It's, I mean, I think it's definitely some advantage, right? Definitely the de decentralization part, you know, you can pay people, the government know what you're doing, right? Yep. Of course, it helps up, like, you know, like I said, like, you know, drug dealers and bad actors. Yeah. Using Bitcoin, the dark web, whatever you want to call it, you know? Yep. And then it's like, it's like there's 10,000 cryptocurrencies, right? Like, how good are they really are, right? Yeah. If they're Bitcoin, at least the Bitcoin, you have that, I think it's the blockchain, we can like track everything down. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, the other side of the coin is like, can you actually really use crypto for uh payments in a secure way like can we can we imagine a society where all we're using is our phone to to make payments yeah a lot of people are using apple pay now but i think lately with geopolitics you know with this russia ukraine stuff yeah. you see how vulnerable the infrastructure is yeah like if the united or okay i'm saying the united states but um, whoever blew Nord Stream up mm -hmm. right if it wasn't the u.s whoever it was ukraine or poland yeah. or the uk it doesn't matter but we're seeing that that these huge infrastructure objects are like really vulnerable. Oh yeah, definitely. And and even these fiber optic connections, um, I think it was the Financial Times that was talking about how Russia is looking at destroying fiber optic cables that are linking the U.S. and, yeah. and Europe. And yeah, what happens if, if there's um, a directed attack on telecommunications? Yeah. Like if our phones go down, I mean, a lot of people are going to be. <laughs> oh yeah. Like are going to go crazy. But if if you have a payment system that's just based on a phone you're in a lot of trouble suddenly. Yeah. You know? I know. That's a good point. And then with Russia, one thing I don't stand, like, I don't know, like, so Russia ruled over Ukraine, right? Pretty much all of NATO is giving Ukraine all this, like, supplies, right? It just surprised me Russia has not said, okay, I, we'll give you one week to stop these arms treatments. If not, we're going to attack this, like, our politics. I'm sure, like, we send the message, like, you know, don't do this right, but it just, like, if you're Russia and, and your enemy's getting supplies from all these countries, you would, like, say something like, hey, you know, like this act of war, stop supplying our enemy or we're going to do this right. <laughs> you know, you know, what's even more funny about the Russia Ukraine conflict. So there are some oil and gas pipelines that go through Ukraine mm -hmm. that are still pumping oil and gas to Europe. What? Through Ukraine. And guess who gets transit fees from Russia? Ukraine. <laughs> you think that'd be the first thing they would cut off. <laughs> yeah, you'd think. You'd think. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot of uh, really kind of interesting things about that whole conflict. Uh, um, it's, it's really interesting to see how like all of the older military technology from kind of the Western side and the Soviet side is getting destroyed in that conflict. Oh, yeah, yeah. And th now there's going to be a new spending cycle in, in both locations where they're going to be, you know, really investing heavily into uh, refilling those inventories. And, and, and talking about Putin, like talk about like making a bad decision, right? So you invade Ukraine to keep them from joining NATO. But now, like, Finland, other countries have joined NATO and, like, doubled your, your border with NATO. Like, all the bad publicity getting, almost had a civil war a couple of days ago. Like, he has to be thinking, like, man, I fucked this up right. Or maybe he says all these yes men saying, oh, it's going great for you, Vladimir Putin. You're the best leader ever. Like, we, we just don't know what's going through his head. It's, it's hard to say. I mean... Uh, there's definitely a, a point when somebody thinks they're invincible, mm -hmm. you know, oh, when, yeah. when you've run a country for so long and it's, a, it's the biggest country in the world. Yeah. Like no matter what you say about how incompetent the Russian military is, et cetera, it certainly there's some arguments on, on that side, but running the, the biggest landmass in the world, that yeah. takes a lot of, yeah. of like, um, uh, government power. Or, um, I think that, if at a certain point you feel that your whole system is under threat and you have to pull out all the stops yeah. and maybe Putin does feel like he's in a corner, maybe, maybe they feel like cause there's, there's people on, on the American side openly yeah. talking about splitting Russia up, yeah. you know, and how it's not fair that they got all these resources, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So uh, in Putin's position, maybe you're thinking, well, this is do or die. Like I, yeah. I better make some stuff happen. Um, if you put you, you got, you know, nuclear weapons here, France has them, Spain has them, all these countries on your doorstep, you know, they're encroaching you, you know, Poland, Poland's in NATO, I think Hungary's in NATO, you know, Ukraine might be gone. So you've seen all your Soviet, 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 Soviet Union black countries like going to NATO, you're like, 
What are you doing? Now you're right. I, I, no one had any clue how the U.S. The, the, I mean, the Russian army was right. Had no idea. Like, like the United States, like today, we could probably put twenty thousand people in any country in the world and go to war with them, right? Like instantly, right? They can't even fucking invade a country next door, right? Like the logistics lines are all jacked up. You know, they have no logistics. All this messed up. You know, like we we had no clue. And like they haven't. They, they don't even have. They don't even control the air in Ukraine yet, right? Like how you not control? If you're a Russian, how you not control the air in Ukraine, right? Yeah, says mind to me. That's that's one thing to me is mind boggling. How do you not control the air in Ukraine? I mean, again, on, on on the other side of the coin, you still have oil and gas that's transiting through Ukraine. Yes, and Ukraine's yeah, Ukraine's getting paid for that yeah. from from Russia. Like, is it is it really a war? Are they? I mean, it's it's hard to say exactly what's going on. I think um, the the Russians have this this military term called maskirovka, mm -hmm. which is um, like. Uh, 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 a facade, a mm -hmm. de deceit tactic, yeah. where you know, you you make it appear one way, and um, in, in actual fact, it's it's you're you're doing something completely yeah. different. And what concerns me, like Ukraine is like known as like being the most, most uh, one of the most corrupt countries <laughs> in the world, right? We're sending them billions of dollars in, in whatever it is, like arms fund or whatever. Like I have to think, how much is it is getting siphoned off, right? Yeah. The same thing happened in Afghanistan. When I was there, we sent all this money to Afghanistan. And we all knew in the in the army, like that the leader of a camp is like siphoning this money off, right? I mean, yeah. it's just a known fact. He was like taking money off for his own, right? Oh, and in the end, you saw him, you know, with suitcases of cash in his helicopter. Well, no, yeah. It was like over a hundred million dollars or yeah. something like that, or, or yeah. tens of millions at least. So we like we bankrolled this guy to, 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 to abandon this country. Right, right. And then so of it was course the same thing happened in Ukraine, right? Of course, you've also got the the Hunter Biden Burisma stuff over there, yeah. which is like that's an that's another deal. I'm, it's hard it's hard to say what's legit, what's not, um, or whether they hired him just to get in closer to the U.S. government, or whether he was actually providing you know some yeah. some legit services. Um, yeah, so th <laughs> there's all sorts of things going on with that. But I mean, on the other hand, on the other hand, you have in America, we a lot of our growth a lot of our key technologies are developed in the military yeah oh yeah and and so the internet came from the department of defense i think no matter what happens in ukraine america is gonna come out with a net net positive yeah i think so too yeah and, and, and obviously ukraine it wasn't for us that nato countries giving the weapons of money they would have been taken over by now oh yeah so it's i don't know and then like i remember this there's a, a there's a retired journal that came out like cnn or fox news one day when, when, uh, it was like two months of the war with Ukraine. And the general said, like, I'm going to get a lot of flack for this. But the Russian military, I equate them to the, to the Vermont National Guard with nuclear weapons. <laughs> like, no one's scared of the Vermont National Guard, but have nuclear weapons, we all be fucking scared of them, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, damn. Yeah, no, I mean, there, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of noise going on, a lot of people talking loudly. But I think the truth is somewhere kind of in the middle where, you know, I, I'm there's there's a lot of kind of um, conspiracy uh, how, you know, the, the uh, Russian spy chief and the American spy chief are meeting up. And uh, some people are saying some of this might be coordinated yeah. where both the U.S. and Russia are kind of getting rid of their old weapons and getting ready to ramp up spending to yeah. refill those inventories. And and that's how economic cycles um, yeah. th that has a huge impact on on our economy. Uh, American weapons are probably the best in the world. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's there's certain categories where the Russians have some really good stuff, like electronic warfare. Um, and uh, I think that what's true, without a doubt, is that American weapons are the most expensive in the world. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So they they all come with a big fat price tag, and yeah. no matter what you think of how effective they are, we're going to be spending a lot of money in the coming coming uh, oh, yeah. you know few years or decades to build. Finally, no, they're building, we're building like new warships, new destroyers. I mean, right. that's something to sell country, and you, all of a sudden you see like four American warships off, off, right. off, your, off your coastline. Like, that's a pretty powerful message. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, I don't know. I can't help but be cynical, you know, yeah. where, where it's like, how, how, much of the, how much of this is solved in backroom deals I know, already? Right? Yeah. Zelensky is uh, certainly absolutely brave, but. Oh, yeah, he's definitely stepped up. Like, who would have imagined this comedian would be such a great leader, you know, at least give the appearance of being a great leader right I mean, yeah but on the other hand he is an actor yeah and it, it does seem like he's you know it's uh, like this role was made for him like joe biden you're reading from a certain teleprompter yeah. right and yeah you've got a pr team around yeah. you making sure everything's going according to plan that you're giving the right image um yeah so i don't know i can't help but be cynical maybe i'm completely wrong yeah <laughs> of course the worst case scenario for a lot of americans are like you know talk about in the news like 
you know, this war is going to drive Russia to be better part of China and China Russia going to combine and, you know, go, go against us, you know. It's really interesting you mentioned that, actually. Um, you've heard of 1984, I assume, right? George Orwell, uh, really famous novel. He talks about Big Brother, the surveillance state, all those concepts. But what a lot of people don't really know about that book is George Orwell has some really interesting ideas about geopolitics and economics. He talks about um, three major world powers, Oceania, East Asia, and Eurasia. Uh, which kind of loosely correspond to the U.S., uh, Russia, and China. And what he said is um, there's always two of those kind of powers that are at war with the other one. And every so often, every generation or so, they'll switch it up. So you'll have um, the two weaker ones team up against the stronger one. And when that stronger one goes through a crisis or falls, then there's a switching of the guard. One of of them will run up and then the other two will yeah. team up to fight against it. So <laughs> maybe we are seeing this cycle at play where China's kind of taking a neutral side and Russia's really rolling the dice on this big conflict with the United States, where there's a chance that this could end pretty badly for us in America if if there's some um some loss of the dollar dominance, we could have some really big financial crises yeah. here. And Who's going to win out of that? China. Yeah. And, and so, you know, hypothetically, you could have this cycle play where China rises up, Russia's rising, and then the United States and Russia work together to go after China over the next 20 years. And that's kind of like defining our, our generation or our new generation. And can you imagine if you're not one of those countries, imagine like you're like, I don't know, Peru or Brazil or like, you know, Switzerland, like, your, your whole future of your country is like the other, what the other three countries are doing, right? Yeah. And there's really nothing you can do about it. Yeah. Except, except hope to pick the right side that you're on. Yeah. Yeah. What else is interesting about Orwell? So he, he also talked about how um, production of military goods is like willful destruction of human labor. So uh, his his idea is that if, if human beings are producing goods, then gradually our standard of living increases. Um, but if our labor is put into material that's intended to be destroyed. When you drop those bombs, you're destroying that labor. Yeah. So you're kind of like preventing the standard of living from going too high, which is also really interesting. I mean, I think a good about. example, I was talking about us like protecting Japan and Korea, like think of all the money Japan Korea didn't have to use on military stuff that they right. invest in, in the infrastructure. Like people don't realize like if you go to Korea, they're, they're so much more advanced than that we are, right? Like we lived for three years back in 2005, 2008. We're getting there, seeing satellite TVs on, on the on the roofs. You're like, mm -hmm. internet speed, like insanely fast, right? Yeah. I can't imagine what it's like now, 20, like almost 20 years later, right? Yeah. Like Korea, I know Korea is like stuff, like so more advanced technology than we are. Mm -hmm. Here it's like, it was almost like we still have dollar speed internet over here sometimes. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think uh, in America, we, we've got this system of capitalism where if you've got the money, everything's good. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe in, in countries like Korea or Japan, where it's more of a uh, collectivist society, maybe it's, it's easier to have access to higher level tech yeah. um, where here you, you need to, you need to be rich basically. Yeah. I mean, I was there for uh, the first weeks I was there. I see this old Korean lady. I mean, she was like pretty old, right? And I had a cell phone that was downloading videos of her kid. Right. I said, I'm pretty sure no 80 year old guy in, in the States is doing this right now. Right. But he's eight years old with a cell phone on download videos of his grandson, right? Yep. Like instantly. Yep. Like people have no clue. Yeah. So next, talk about your time at SMC Capital. What were you doing there? Yeah, well, actually, I was um, only on the advisory side. By the time I came on board to SMC Capital, they had pretty much deployed all of their uh, investment fund. So what I was doing was helping portfolio companies out with their communications and um, kind of their tokenomics and outreach to, to different stakeholders. Uh, I was also on their events side. So we ran um, some different events. Uh, one of them was called um, ST Future, uh, basically focused on like tokenomics, tokenizing real estate and real world assets. Uh, the idea was that you can have a real world asset, like a piece of art or a building, and the ownership of it could be uh, basically implemented in tokens and distributed across a large amount of people. And so they're not in business anymore? 
They are now working on an incubator. Um, and this is in Austin or New York City or where they at? Out of New York, but they're they're more of a distributed team. Okay. So okay. Yeah. Uh, they they move around quite a bit. When I was there, one of the partners was in New York. One of the partners was in Mykonos. <laughs> okay. Uh, but we were moving around all the time. And then you did some work at a company called things called SyncFi. Yeah, SyncFi. That's the one that just raised like ten million dollars recently. Right. Exactly. Can you talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. SyncFi is like uh, the plaid for Latin America. That's what they want to be is uh, financial APIs for banks, where um, you know a lot of a lot of our uh, um, uh, online kind of financial things are really seamless these days. We can connect our bank account to our PayPal or Venmo and you know, you get some money on Venmo, you transfer it to your bank in a few days, it's there. Suddenly you've got, you know, 50 bucks in your bank account where it came through Venmo. A lot of that is handled through financial APIs. And um, the, the biggest company in America that does that is called Plaid. Uh, they've been in business, they're, they're now a unicorn, um, you know, over a billion dollar valuation, very successful company. So SyncFi was trying to do similar things for the Latin American market. And so the $10 million y'all raised, was it out of United States VC, Latin America VC? There were different VCs involved, um, international and American. Yeah. And how would involve you, were you with the fundraising part of it? So early on, I was, I was uh, fairly involved with sending out investor communications and um, trying to reach out to my own contacts who, who um, invest in different companies. And then I, I left in... February, March of 2022 to be a full-time founder on my latest project. And they ended up raising in December, 2022. So what's the advice you can give people about their fundraise right now from your experiences? Like <laughs> uh, my experience as a founder, as you know, a, a exposure to VC, exposure to companies that have fundraised. I think the most important thing is having traction, like a real business model. If you're looking to sell parts of your company off to VCs, that means you your business model won't be um, whole for a little while. Yeah. You're going to need somebody else to fund everything until you can actually generate revenue, um, which if you can do it where you don't need outside help, that's the best oh, yeah. way. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. If you can bring in uh, revenue to your company and be, you know, generating a profit and, uh, or at least being able to cover all your operating expenses, you're in a much better position, um, not only as a company, but also as a uh, for your fundraise. If you've got uh, you know cash flow, if you've got product market fit, which means you understand why people are buying, why people spend money with you, then there's a lot easier of a case to be made to potential investors about why they should take a piece of your company. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of founders don't get it. Like VCs only fund like one percent of startups. And even that, that's no indicator you'll be successful, right? Yep. So many VC back firms like fail yeah. for a reason, right? Yeah. And I think uh, with a lot of VCs, they have um, they have kind of like the, their niche trend of where they where they need to allocate money or where they prefer to allocate money. Like uh, for a lot of the big funds in crypto now, it's infrastructure, and um, if you're if you don't fit nicely within their kind of um, niche of investing it's going to be pretty difficult for you to raise from them anyway yeah. and i know i know a lot of like new new founders like pc founders they only they only maybe fifty thousand hundred thousand right but then a lot of these like shit we only write take for a million dollars right yep I, I, well i'll take a million dollars from you don't get me wrong but i see fifty thousand right and then there's no like nothing for them right yeah yeah i mean on the other hand vcs are also if you've built a company before and sold it or scaled it or um, spun it off, then VCs are going to be a lot more interested yeah. just by default. Yeah. And if you haven't, that road's going to be hard. Yeah. Especially if you're like coming from like middle America, no one knows you, whatever. Like, like I know what kills me. Like people say, no, go to family and friends. Like I am the family and friends, right? I have no family and friends. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. No. And I mean, uh, I think uh, so for, for founders, right. And me being in that seat myself now, this is, uh, expect to hear, I think it's like 300 no's yeah. before you get a single yes. I, I think, uh, man, Howard Schultz Femmes heard like a thousand nineteen no's yeah. or something crazy like Easy. that. Easy. Like you gotta be mentally tough, right? You gotta be mentally tough. You gotta have true conviction that what you're doing not only is a good thing, but is actually a business. Because if you're building a company that 
it needs to be a business. That's the only way that determines your success. Like if you've got cash flow, if you've got people who who vote with their dollars for your company, yeah. that's the only way that you have a business. If you don't have that, maybe it's better to do something else. Yeah, some of these people think I'll be an entrepreneur and be famous and like rich in six months, right? Yep. And like, of course, Apple's Apple, but most people realize Apple and not Apple like eight years in, right? It took right. eight years like figure shit out. I mean, eight yep. years. Like that's not a, that's a long time. And I mean, I think we're in Seattle, right? We, of course, the biggest company here, uh, Microsoft and Amazon, yeah. but Amazon's story, Jeff Bezos, um, was running an online bookstore yeah. and you come to a VC with that idea today, you're going to get laughed out of yeah. the room. Yeah. No, you want to get a meeting. You want And even back then they're like yeah. online bookstore, but people don't even care and then, about books then, that and much. Then we, and then we told them how it worked. Yeah. They order a book. I, I go to Barnes and Noble, buy the book and send it to them. Yeah. What? Yeah. Are yeah. you kidding me right now? Yeah, exactly. And yet, and yet, you know, 20 years later, generated profit, now one of the biggest companies I mean, in this, the world. This AWS alone. Right. Like, you could break each component of Amazon, Amazon Prime, Amazon, whatever you want to call it, you know, Amazon this, Amazon, all the buy itself, like legitimate business, right? Mm -hmm. I got you around pretty soon to be Amazon everything, right? Mm -hmm. It has a chip, you're going to speak in your finger. Amazon, blah, 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 you know. Yeah, there was a comedian who was making a joke about Amazon Prime and, and how um, we, we are this like um, instant gratification culture where we need something as fast as possible. Yeah. And um, you have you have in the future, you have Amazon now. Yeah, Amazon <laughs> now. Yeah. You think you have it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You and then you you'll have. have Amazon before. Oh, yeah. Where it, they the, mind. the yeah. AI can like figure out when your light bulb's coming out. And I know, right? Yeah. You, you get something in your door as soon as you open the package, suddenly, bzz, 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 and your light bulb goes out and you realize why you need this thing. <laughs> I mean, it's a good time we're living in, I think. You know, like a lot of people say this is the worst time ever. Like, no, it's not. Like, bubonic plague, uh, Europe was the worst time ever, right? You know, like the, the Nazi war camps or uh, concentration camps the worst time ever. Right now, I don't know if we're leaving the worst time ever, right? Well, who, who was saying, uh, I think it was Charles Dickens, it was the best of times, it was yeah. the worst of times. Yeah. It's kind of like, we have totally different problems now. We have uh, um, a, a serious kind of like mental health yeah. problem. This we, year in Seattle. We were talking about kids who are obsessed with their phones from the, from the time they're waddling around in diapers. And how does that super addicting technology, how is that going to like affect our mental health even 10 years down the road? I know. Like what, what's the generation even going to look like? Just the, just the, the screen coming to your eyes 24 seven, right? Yeah. Is that like maybe 40 years from now, they're going to like, you know, I'll make this up. Like right now, if we say 20% of people have wear glasses, it's 40 years, like 89% of people have to wear glasses because like that damage to retinas through like eye glare, what do you call it? You know? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's definitely advantages to being now, of course, disadvantage, you know, like, I don't know. It's interesting times. How about your founder journey? What, what are you uh, uh, excited for? And I mean, how has it been being a founder with like from the mental health aspect? Uh, first of all, it, 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 I think like, if I could suck sometimes, you know. Right? Yes, I know. Like, like in my mind where I'm at right now, I should be here a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. And like, I've made mistakes like hiring the wrong tech people, making wrong decisions, following wrong advice. No matter the advice was given like in a good spirit, good attempt, like, you know, this. For sure. And then of course you lose momentum. Yeah. So like life stuff happens, you know, like you might have a personal emergency you got to take care of or like. Right. Or then you of course you like like take shiny you know, like chase shiny objects, right? Yeah. Or, or waste time like helping someone else, thinking if you get help them, I was gonna help you out. But then like they go out of business, then you're like, fuck, like should I just waste six months of my time? Yep. I'm like, but you just have you gotta have like a conviction, right? You gotta believe what you're doing, right? Like, yeah, for sure. You have a past, like like I wanna say small business owners time and money HR, right? So that's what I'm gonna do. That's my like core piece, but it's it's not easy, right? And of course, people come along like it's, it's kind of like people like. Oh, Jason, you're over social media. You must, you're killing it. You, I know you make a lot of money. Well, actually, I'm not right. That's like all smoke and mirrors, right? What you got to do to make people to. think you're successful, right? Like, no one's going to buy shit from you. Like, it, like if you Google me, stuff comes up. So, how could I have to get customers? No one's going to buy something from you if they Google you and nothing comes up, right? Yeah. You got to have some kind of credibility, so to speak, right? Right. Like somebody, people backing you up. Like, but it's, it's not an easy journey, right? And of course, people are like, oh, you should do this, you do that. It's not that easy, right? How long have you been doing it? If you ask my wife, a day too long. <laughs> so um, I got that idea back in 2016, I think. I did the LLC in 2017. I was still working in different companies. I did the um, corporation in 2018. Made, 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 basically made a lot of mistakes, right? But like one thing with me, like, like a lot of tech, tech people that have a product here, marketing here, I'm kind of reversed. 
like I've done great marketing, great branding. The tech's never caught up right. I just mm. think, so I'm actually hiring a, a, a actual one thing with my tech journey. Like I've always brought on people like like do me a favor, right? We'll help you out, right? But I was never the full time like focus, right? Yeah. I'm finally like gonna hire someone, pay someone like to be full time, right? So hopefully that helps out, right? Oh, that's awesome! Congrats, man. But it sucks, right? Ain't gonna lie, right? Like like I tell people, I do these panels, like different people, like it's not unicorns and rainbows, right? It's what about the funding situation? How's that been for you? Uh, so I've never actually really gone all out funding, right? Um, have you raised money from investors? Not yet, right? So I'm doing a crowdfunding campaign right now. I've, I've done like all the equity crowdfunding, yeah, on refunding, right? Of course, the plan is like I'm probably not. I'm probably too early to do a crowdfunding because like I don't really have that much traction, right? Like I have, a, I've had a couple of customers have letters, letters of intent, beta tests, right? Like someone told me you need a hundred or something, like use a hundred beta tests, a hundred user, right? So, but I've done the legwork. Like I have like a list of twenty five people I'm working on. Like, like I know like who invests in HR tech, different locations, right? I have mm -hmm. a good network, you know. But it's, yeah, it's and then like people tell like like marketers and investors will say, go sell your product if you're not ready, right? Mm. Like no one's gonna pay money for HR if there's not a product, right? Yeah, it's it's not gonna happen. Like I have, I have a good friend, uh, Brandon Doyle. He has his company called Violet, and so they they put like a machine in your in your in your office space, and it cleans all the air, right? Yeah. Well, he learned like no one sell this buys it unless it works right. So you can't go, hey, buy this, you know, this this machine. It doesn't work yet, right? But pay me money every month, right? No one's gonna do that, right? So you you gotta have a product. Mm -hmm. Of course, the, the the argument would be that. Well, if you have a good product, you know, people are going to buy it, buy it, right? It's just, it's like chicken egg thing all the time, right? Yep. Like one thing, like me, if I go back in time, I say I would learn how to code, right? But what I, I don't know. I don't, I don't have the skill set for that. I don't think you know, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so hard to build a team as a startup, right? It's just because you go through so many people, like, like, because like you tell me, come, come work for me for free for six months, right? Well, they got shit they got to pay, right? Funding they got to do, right? Yep. And then you have equity, right? But I tell people equity, like, suppose you come work for me, right? I say, hey, I'm going to give you 2% equity to the company. I'm going to tell you, hey, see that pot of gold and rainbow? It's all yours, baby. <laughs> Probably ain't going to fucking happen, right? And like, I tell people too, like, the equity set up, like, it's set up for the CEO to fuck you over, right? All the problems in the CEO, right? Because you have this cliff vesting for 12 months. Yep. You can work for me like 11, 11 months. I fuck. I ain't going to pay Alec this fucking equity shit. You're fired, right? Yep. And it's, 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 of course, it's like that, you know, but that's the way it is, right? But startups, it's, it's a lot of fun to be wrong, right? Like, you can, like, maybe a Tuesday afternoon, take an hour off, have a beer with a friend, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a hassle, right? Or, like, a lot of people, two, two things. If you want to make a lot of money, you probably just need to get a regular job. And number two, if you're a founder, you probably need to get a mental health checkup. But, like, you have to be fucking mentally insane to just do this shit, right? Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, guilty. It's, yeah. And as far as taking care of yourself, like people say, oh, I wake up in the morning, I fucking do, you know, meditations, exercise. I try to do that once in a while, but a lot of times I wake up in the morning, get on the phone and go to work. Right. I mean, it's like, there's so much time in the day. Right. Yeah. And we all can't have personal service like Elon Musk does. That's true. True. That's true. Hopefully one day though. I mean, um, I don't know if you, do you follow Madrona Ventures? Yeah. 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 They're a local Seattle fund here. Um, I followed them on LinkedIn. Uh, and it, it's interesting seeing the kind of companies that they're looking at and investing at, uh, investing in. I think uh, what's what's really big. Obviously, we're in a hype cycle for AI right yeah. now. If you're an AI company doing AI infrastructure, so Madrona, they had an event a couple weeks ago I went to. It was like a based on AI founders and stuff. They had all the AI founders doing a panel and stuff. You know? Nice. That's pretty good. But they're talking about uh, AI agents who can you know be your personal assistants. Okay. Without needing to hire personal assistant yeah. which that's coming that's oh, going to yeah. be a, a really big big market i think uh in, in the next 10 years probably where your personal assistant is going to live in the cloud and you're going to be yep. able to interact through your phone yep. just like what it was going to have the jasper you know like iron man's jasper you know yeah it was gonna have a jasper right 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 all powerful Jasper. It's going to be able to do all your social media posting yeah. and all your appointment booking and your taxes and your hiring and, you know, all that fun stuff, posting the job descriptions. Yeah. I was watching something the other day where like, you know, like, like, like call centers right now, call center might be someone from India calling, right? Yeah. They, they say AI is going to be set up where like, suppose you're in Brooklyn or South Africa, South, you know, Texas, mm -hmm. the person is calling you to be sound exactly like you. Yeah. 
like the accent would be like, oh man, you're from my town of Texas or you whatever case may be, the same exact accent, right? Well, who was it that was saying um, all you need is three seconds of somebody's voice before the AI can yeah. can like fully mimic every single like intonation to to a high degree of confidence. And I know that there are some scams out there where yeah. you know they're they're calling people's kids and getting three seconds of their their kid's voice. Yeah. And then calling the parents with the kid's voice saying, hey, I'm in trouble. And what's my social security number? And suddenly, you know, one thing leads to another and you've got a, a loan in your name where, I know, yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, or, or you're like, oh, shit, I used to have 25000 Now I'm on a negative $10. What the fuck happened? Right, right. Your account gets drained or, or whatever, uh, which, is, which is pretty crazy because, I mean, now in, in an age when anything can be spoofed mm -hmm. and these models are getting better and better and better every day, every single interaction we have with MidJourney or ChatGPT makes it better. Yeah. I know one thing as an entrepreneur, like people say, how do you feel as an entrepreneur? My thing is like, you don't feel as an entrepreneur until you quit, right? As long as you're going to go on. But, you know, but having said that, sometimes I still wish I had was the ability to quit, right? Because I'm like, man, I just want to quit, but I, I can't write. Like, it's really the ability to quit, like do something else, right? But you got to keep yeah. on going. It's yeah, it's a it's a tough journey, right? So many people are doing it, you know. Of yeah. course, there's like a lot of wanna wantrepreneurs out there who are just doing it because like go networking and do stuff like that, you know. Yeah. And of course, like you know, it, it, is a is a is a better place to do it in Seattle? Maybe not. Maybe San Francisco, right? But you know, New York. Yeah, Austin. Miami. Yeah, Miami. Austin. Can you imagine being an entrepreneur? You want to be start a, like a tech company, and you're like from Bismarck, North Dakota. No, I can't imagine. Omaha, that. Nebraska, or like you know, like. I mean, this is a different advantage of being here, right? You're a needle in a haystack, that's for sure. You're definitely advantage of being here, right? Just a networking you do, people yeah. you meet, right? And most people generally do want to help you out, right? Yeah, yeah. I think Seattle's got a, a growing ecosystem. I think finally we're starting to figure out we need to we need to step up our game and yeah. uh, make use of all the tech resources yeah. and talent that we've got out here. Yeah, so I have some criticism. Like the Seattle, it's like in the Seattle area, like you like you have investors who like they're like you know I only invest in like fundable business, right? I know these 10 startup founders were told, no, can you get a meeting here? Went to New York, New York San Francisco, Austin, like funding with six months, right? Yeah. Like, how did they go fund somewhere else gets funding in six months, right? Like, what's going on here, right? And of course, another criticism of Seattle, like, there's all these scholars, right? You know, talk, there's like, Watch the American Incubator, Founders Live, there's like, New Tech Northwest, there's like, Startup Haven, um, what's his name? Uh, there's a Tacoma Ventures, all these things have events that like, they're like, they don't want to communicate this thing like you know yeah yeah that's true that's true that's changing though i it mean it's changing yeah i know i know we're finally starting to figure some things out up, up here in the pacific northwest yeah i know seattle's like it takes like it, it seems like you know of course slightly like, there's like you gotta you gotta give up your firstborn son or find a blood to talk some right right <laughs> you go to you know, you know the bay area i went there one time like i had like six meetings in the first day right yeah i'll nice. talk to you right just like instantly right yeah what are you doing yeah come talk to me right i got some time right yeah that shit ain't happening in seattle right Unless yeah you know someone know someone right which is unfortunate, right? It is. Well, of course, San Francisco have like, you know, I think maybe $100 of VC money there. Seattle has worked the one. Maybe right. 100 VC firms has one here. So like, you know, it's a different story, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think um, what I'm kind of getting um, in, in my, my own startup journey is that if you can run a business and your business generates the cash flow, then don't take the VC money if you don't yeah. need it. Yeah, exactly. Because a lot of those guys, I mean, if they're not like, if they're not going to be able to give you contracts or mm -hmm. contacts yeah. or a sales funnel, I then I mean, like, what kind of partner like, are they really going to be? I know, right? And like, I joke around, like, what's the test to be a VC, right? Besides having a lot of money, right? A lot of, like, you know, that's not VC. A lot of people in general, like, you and I hire to cut, cut your grass, right? Like, I'm going to go on business with you. And you, you're like, what, what's going on here, right? Yeah. Like, they're, they're smart people oh, always. Yeah. They're oh, yeah. generally, also, what I've noticed about VCs is they're usually, like, weirdly nice <laughs> oh yeah they, they, they never want to say no <laughs> yeah but it's, maybe it's, it's fun number, hanging out maybe it's the number award maybe you'll get back with me or, or, or get with me you have more tracks yeah yeah like, exactly how much more tracks do you need yeah how many how many ways are there to say no i <laughs> uh, know right just tell me no yeah and then like you know the joke i've heard people say like in seattle like like here they want you have like a round metrics for a pc round right mm -hmm. like shit like What's going on here, right? Yeah. But then, you know, they invest in a lot of good companies, a lot of good companies doing good stuff here in Seattle. So maybe this matter just being people and being haters, like, no, like, not one, like, you no, know, give credit what credit is due, right? Right. But Seattle is like definitely a place to be doing what we're doing, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I see for my, my project, I think 
what's nice about Seattle is we've got a lot of gamers here. The weather is really crappy. Uh, for anyone that doesn't know, there's about um, seven months out of the year that are unusable <laughs> here. Um, we really just, I mean, you're incentivized basically to stay indoors, uh, which makes it great for building a product that people like to use indoors. And um, I think that's one of the one of the draws for Seattle for tech talent is there's a lot of uh, incentive to be indoors and work indoors and play indoors uh, in Seattle for a large part of the year, um, which is interesting. Yeah, we're talking about tech talent, like a lot of people are like, man, Jason, I don't understand why we have a problem with tech talent. You got all these the Amazon, Microsoft. Yes, exactly. They're paying them two hundred, two fifty thousand right. dollars. You know, that kind of leads for a startup. Yep. And if they're really good, they're starting their own startup, right? Yep. So it's just like, yeah, it's, it's a hassle. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So next, are you still with Stellar Dream or is that something in the past? Stellar Dream is my comic book. Okay. Um, that's uh, a brand that we are uh, spinning out under our uh, main company, Thigio. So uh, the main company that I'm building is Thigio. It's an entertainment technology company. We've got a few different products that we're building, including a digital interactive comic book and a uh, hybrid physical digital board game, which we'll be spinning out into a fully digital game as well. Um, yeah, we're building the technology in-house. We um, have a lot of commitments to GitHub and um, we've got a lot of user testing going on. What's really interesting about a physical digital product, like a, a board game mobile game, is that when you're playing in person with people, you can iterate really quickly. Uh, so you can see how people really react and adjust the game as needed based on real experiences that you get to see firsthand. Okay. Yeah. And so it's like under your Thigio brand? Right. Okay. Yeah. So you, you, you've done like pitching for your company before. Like you, like you did Founders Live recently. Oh, right? yeah. How, how was that experience? Founders Live, it's great. I mean, um, I think being able to synthesize your pitch in 99 seconds That's fucking tough. is tough. I did last year. That's fucking tough. It's tough. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it's part of it is being able to tell a good story. I really enjoyed working with uh, some of the storyteller um, kind of resources that Founders Live provides. Yeah, they provide your coach for free and all kind of stuff. Right, right. And it helped me refine my own pitch. Um, so I've got it down to where I can tell a story in under three minutes. Okay. Uh, and, and it's really helpful. I think. Talk about the, why should your founders go out and pitch, like put, be like building public pitches all the time. Right. Why should you should, should a founder or uh, anyone put this up out there, so to speak. Yeah. So it's, it's a great opportunity to refine your pitch. I think that's probably first and foremost, if you can convince an audience of more or less kind of savvy people, you know, but people who come in with different experiences, but who have general understanding of the uh, founder ecosystem. If you can con uh, convey your ideas to that audience in, in 99 seconds, you're going to be able to convey ideas to investors in a short amount of time in an effective way. I think that's probably the, the biggest uh, um, uh, takeaway from, from pitching at an event like that. There's also really good context that come out of it no matter what okay. if you put yourself on stage and people resonate with your idea they'll come talk to you and maybe those those uh, meetings will evolve into something something bigger there are investors that go there are vcs that go there are um, entrepreneurs that go angel investors uh, different types of uh, groups um, or investment organizations and incubators accelerators that attend which all of those resources are super helpful especially for really early stage entrepreneurs uh, and founders so Th those can also turn into really great opportunities. I know we talked earlier about what they should, should change in school. So two things I say should change school. One is like sales and public speaking. It's kind of the same thing, right? Like I think you should be able to get in front of people and convince them to do what you want to do at our yes. age, right? I mean, it's invaluable, right? Yeah. And think about if you're a public speaker, if you get in front of a, a group of people, they're going to automatically assume that you're an expert, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you get like if you get up and talk about sales or marketing or simulation, they're going to think. If Alex makes a simulation, he must be a simulation expert, right? Yeah. And then, of course, that's you to prove that you're not an expert, right? Yeah. Whether you talk, right? But yeah, I think it's very important that founders get there and, and spread the story, whatever your case may be, right? Yeah. But so many people don't do that, right? Speaking of persuasion, though, that's really interesting. It just reminded me of our AI conversation, you know, and um, I watched this video recently of uh, some, some very plugged in people talking about some of the potential dangers of where AI could go. And if, if you're, if we're, if we're going to build a bot 
an AI chatbot or, or some kind of AI tool that's focused on persuasion. And imagine letting this thing run wild with people, trying to persuade them of certain concepts or um, um, products, you know, and then over 10 years, that's all it does is just gets really good at persuasion. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, yeah, there's, there's good things. We can hire someone like that to do some of our automated sales, but then there's bad things as certain politicians can, you know, use that kind of technology yeah. to promote certain messages that then can resonate better with. Yeah. with now what if like you go, go, could go brand and go back to your soft box or like, you know, like, I suppose like you have a soft part for like lollipop, right? Yep. And so they know you want to sell you something. You know, have a lollipop in there, or you know, case maybe, or maybe, maybe like a, a old lady back the day gave you a, a sandwich. You're hungry, like so. You 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 have a penny of old ladies, like it's, it's so much portrayed, like so much bad stuff can happen on first year, right? Yeah. And when a child they're doing like all the social stuff in China, like they're tracking your social scores, or whatever, and right? Like, just fucking scary as shit, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, one thing about China, like like it's good and bad. Like in China, those pips, like in China, they made a they built a bridge like a day, right? Yeah. How long would this take to do this in America, like? This this, summer, this pothole has been about 20 years, right? You know, like, <laughs> but again, do you want to go the way that China's doing to make it like that? I don't know, right? It's, it's it's scary and impressive too, right? Yeah, it's impressive. You build a city, but then if there's no, no one that lives, let's point of the city. Yeah. And just like they say, they're building, I think, Saudi River, like they put like 10 million people in a two block area or something crazy like that, you yeah. know? Like, I mean, I, I, I'm thinking like all the rats, all the roaches, all the, species all the race you know but i guess i have a plan to get all out there right well i mean if you're in the desert it's you got you get different problems i guess yeah that's true too right yeah i don't know i mean people have good ideas but bad judgment i think you know yeah what do you think about comic books you ever get into those yeah i used yeah. to be a big comic book guy really spider-man spider-man Spider -Man? Spider -Man, Spider -Man. marvel marvel universe i'm always spending like too much time at the bookstore because i was too poor to buy comics i go to the bookstore every day to read them all real fast you know yeah. I've been a big Spider-Man do, do you read any comic books online? No. Not these days? I haven't read a comic book in a long time, actually. Yeah. Besides the movies and stuff, yeah. Right, right, right. I think um, it's really interesting because now you have a lot of different platforms where creators can get their stuff out. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I know a lot of people making new comic books, you know. And then, like, yeah, like, you read a comic book and Spider-Man just pops out, right? Yes. Hey, Jason, you, you, you get to do the story, right? Yep. You know, like. Does, Pick your own adventure. Yeah. Does, does Peter Parker go on a date with Mary Jane or does he go fight the octopus, right? Yeah. Does he do this? He do that, right? Right, right, right. Yeah. Spider-Man has always been like that, uh, that, that he would like just always like goes wrong. Like the last Spider-Man we were, he had to give up like um, Mary Jane to save the world, right? Now no yeah. one knows he's Spider-Man, right? It's like, so like always happened to Spider-Man, unfortunately, right? Yeah, for sure. For sure. He's like, not the anti-hero, but the, yeah. Yeah, I, our, with our comic book, um, I think we have a, a pretty interesting idea where people can own characters okay. in a comic book. And you're gonna do? Are you doing NFTs that kind of stuff? Yeah, we are doing some NFTs uh, with with our comic book. Uh, if you want, we do have a prototype of how we uh, how our experience goes on our website. Uh, so the the concept is you can click on a character and there. You pull up your website. Yeah, sure. This one here, right? Yeah. So if you scroll down, oh, that's that means I need to go okay. renew my parking pretty soon. Okay. Uh, if you scroll down, there is a uh, keep going a little bit further. There's a section called Stellar Dream. Keep going, right here. So if you click on that, that takes you to our comic book. That's what our comic book's called. And what our concept is: if you hover over one of these characters. It highlights, and when you click on it, you can then click on this image, and it'll take you to the character. So that's kind of the concept that we're building right now. So off topic, like, how, how do you decide how to design these characters? Like, someone designed for you? You did like some kind of user testing? Our co-founder is in Tokyo. Okay. Uh, well, outside of Tokyo, he's uh, worked in the the gaming and kind of uh, illustration okay. illustration okay. scene for, for quite a while. So for, with these characters, we actually base them on real people. Okay. Um, and what we want to do is we want to give brands the opportunity to own characters in these, these stories as well. So imagine if you had a, uh, like a mobile phone brand or a fast food brand that's able to own their own character and then get exposure to, to an audience that way. Okay. That's kind of our idea.
And can people like make their own characters and bring them to your game? Yeah, that's what we want to do as well. So uh, these are the main characters. These are what we call the god levels. Okay. Um, but then we also want to have secondary characters. The psychedelic jam. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So powered by LSD and messing with my friends. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. They all have unique powers that are tied to different things. And, um, you know, they start out at, at this rough concept stage, but then they can be customized. But in the future, we want it to be where any person can make a character that looks like them uh, and be a secondary character in the comic book. Um, yeah. So, how long does it take for your guy like to develop a character? Like, like I'm going to make a character, the Bourbon guy, from <laughs> making the Bourbon guy to actually like having it like, all done i'm sure it's a pretty long process yeah it's a pretty long process it, it can take up to a month just there's the illustrations and you get that stuff down yeah depending on how many like back and forth iterations there are so if there's um you know some um uh feedback loops where we have to go back and change some things a few times then you know up to two months in a so this was a comic book yeah is the idea like make turn the comic into a video game in the future yeah, so we've got a, uh, a, like I mentioned, our board game, mobile game. If you want, you can play that video. That'll give people uh, the loom, uh, the other tab. Yeah, okay. that one. Okay. That'll give that'll give people an idea. To one X. Yeah. Just yeah, just push play. That's your son, there. That's my nephew. nephew. Oh, he invented this game at a park. Over the last year, I've tested this game thousands of times with hundreds of players and launched an app live on the Apple App Store. Just like a video game, you can pick your map, character, and game mode. The maps in USB are mazes with pathways that are defined by walls. Our first production map is called Kraken, but we have more coming soon. We're planning to release 100 playable characters called God Levels. Each of these collectible game characters will have its own unique ultimate moves that can change the course of the game when you use it. When you connect to a room in USB, the app randomizes the game pieces and tells you where to place them on the board. It tracks your stats and inventory and handles all of the attacks. You start out with a certain amount of energy that you can increase by collecting treasures and defeating monsters. You can use energy to move across the board or attack, and your ultimate goal is to defeat the other players. Having an app opens up a world of possibilities. In the future, we want to launch a cooperative game mode. We also want to add animations for every attack and action. We're open sourcing the Unity code so fans can create their own game modes and kids can learn how to code. Imagine being able to create your own custom character or game map and getting them delivered to your door. We're excited to be building an augmented reality version of our game as well. UFB is connected to our original comic book called Stellar Dreams. Each of the god levels is a character in the comic book as well. What's unique about our technology is you can click on a character and find out more information. UFB is at the crossroads of video games, mobile games, board games, and comic books, some of the biggest markets in the entertainment space. We can do some really cool and fun things in the space as we grow. We also want to release a fully digital version of our game in the future. We're a team of developers, artists, and nerds with experience in gaming. You said a nerds? Yeah. That's why we believe we're the right team to make this happen. With your help, game night will never be the same again yeah so the idea is we have these characters that are main characters in a comic book and playable characters in a game okay um so there's like this cross-platform ownership we want to then you know do some co-ownership of ip where if we do merchandise we'll share revenue and um th those kinds of things so hoping to and so how long have you been working on this uh, well, I started it. <laughs> it started as a uh, started as a fiction novel back in college, um, in my undergrad went around 2011 when I started writing, and then in 2019 I started working with my co-founder in Japan, 
to turn it into a, a company. How do you find your co-founder in Japan? How'd that come about? Actually through my time at SMC Capital. Okay. So we had this uh, event in Los Angeles for um, one of our clients uh, that were looking to raise money. Um, so we, we hosted a private dinner for them and invited investors to come. Um, and I, you know, got to drinking with one of the investors at the event who happened to be from Japan. And so that's how that relationship started. Um, so how do you, you all been different country. How do y'all communicate? Uh, line. Okay. The message messenger app. It has automatic translations built in. What's, what's it called again? Line. 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 Okay. It's like the WhatsApp for Japan. Okay. All right. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Um, so what, what's the, what's the, um, plan for the Gio moving forward? Yeah, so we're actually going to be launching a crowdfunding campaign on Kickstarter okay. in the coming weeks. I remember talking about that, the boat trip we did. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the idea is we want to sell game boxes. Um, equity crowdfunding sounds pretty interesting, but I also I think that what we want to do in the beginning is to show that we've got traction. Yeah. Actually, make some sales going, produce some things, ship them to folks, and then um, around October, November, start looking at a VC raise. Okay. Start talking to, to potential investors. So what, what's some, um, here's a question for you. How does Stigio fail? When I quit. <laughs> when I say it's over, that's when it's over. That's it. So, so back to AI real fast, right? Yeah. So this is my channel, AI, right? I think the big thing we got, like, like who calls AI, right? Is it a good person, bad person? Is a bad person code AI and have the AI do, do bad things, right? How do you prevent that, right? Like, how do you know who's actually coding this stuff? Like, how you know open AI with Sam Almond is being coded correctly, like you know, in a value-based way, right? And like some AI has been done like maliciously wrong, right? Like how do you go back to the core, the core set and validate, okay, Jason is coding this AI thing. Jason is a good person. He has the, the best intention for the earth in, in his mind, right? Versus okay, fucking Adolf Hitler has AI capability. He's fucking, you know, doing this fucking crazy shit, right? Like how do you prevent that, right? No, that's the problem's even deeper than that, I think. Uh, so going back to Russia, Russia has some air defense uh, units that can make fully autonomous shoot downs mm -hmm. of flying objects, um, which obviously, you know, you use AI to track and then to execute firing the missile. Um, so so the tech that kind of Terminator technology is already there you know, russia also has some unmanned uh, tank robots that, that use ai and sure you can conceptualize somebody coming in and hacking those things or or like um uh, uh hacking the server that controls those things um and it's the same with with a lot of these ai models like what if what if you can really easily download those ai models and tweak some of the parameters uh it wouldn't matter if the intention is good yeah. it wouldn't matter if the underlying code is quote unquote good if you can tweak the parameters to however you want them to be then their intentions may not even matter you may be able to make of it whatever you want regardless of of their intentions even worse what if you could hack you know some of their servers or some of their um um like where where the um processing is done and tweak some of the parameters in real time where it affects millions of users. Um, I'm sure, you know, th these companies have top of the line security where there, there's millions invested into that, but well, it's, it's been possible. proven everything you get hacked. Yeah, you know, exactly. Things are unhackable system, unfortunately. Right. 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 So if you can get into those systems and manipulate the parameters uh, and, and have those manipulations then go out to millions of people, you can do some real harm. Yeah. Um, I think there's and the challenge is a lot of people only know the harm is being done to them. Right. It's this everyday thing. Yeah, exactly. So if we are in if we are in a simulation, does that mean that free will is a farce and a fake thing? Like no such thing as free will if we're in a simulation. I knew we were gonna get into philosophy. Yeah. You wanna um, you want another drink real fast? Yeah, sure. Which one do you want to try? Um, I'm open. Whatever, whatever you're the guest, so you, you feel like pouring. Yeah. Man, I I know I want to try this small batch. This one? Okay. <laughs> of course, but um you know if that's the that's the nice one i want to try russell brands as well i'm curious about that oh so it's not russell brands liquor oh sorry yeah it's the this thing this thing this russell's thing brand yeah, yeah got it okay oops i just i just picked that up and got my mistake so hopefully this is worth the money but who knows it looks pretty good yeah i did a good job on the, on the, on the i, I didn't like the bottle yeah 
Um, cheers. Thank you. Pleasure being here. I like the smell. Oh, that's good. That's good. Yeah. I like that. Uh, sorry, could you repeat the question? <laughs> um, actually, I forgot what I asked you. Oh, one, one regret I have, one regret I have is that it took me so long to go from Jack Daniels and being like real bourbon, right? Yeah. Like, I wasted so many years drinking fucking crap bourbon, right? Yeah. And, this, and first of all, like, who realized there's like literally hundreds and thousands of bourbons in the world, right? Yeah. You go to the liquor store, like, I, th- I, I have a friend in Houston. He has like a, he has a bar. He has a hundred bottles of bourbon. Yeah. All different. Different places. Yeah. Different tastes. Yeah. You were asking something about simulation. And- oh yeah. It's, oh yeah. Is a, if you are a simulation, does that mean free will is the fucking fake free will. thing? Right. Free will. Does, I'm how, glad we got a drink how, before how, that. How can it be free will if we're in a simulation? It's, it's really interesting that you mentioned that. Uh, it, in my TEDx talk, um, back in 2017, the Japanese were working on this robot. Uh, I think it was called Alter. Uh, basically, the, the robot um, has a central um, pattern generator or, or something like this, where if you, uh, the, the robot is humanoid, so it's got hands. And if you interact with its hand. And to be clear, we're not talking about the Japanese sex robots, right? <laughs> not yet, but those are coming. Oh, and it's only a matter of time before we uh, never marry a human again, because the sex robots are going to be the absolute perfect partners that you could ever want. Until the, the plastic rubs off and you and, and, and it's for years. <laughs> hey, man, maybe that's what gets some people going. I don't know. Um, but the, the, the robot's able to this learn. Really yeah, I like that a lot. The robot's <laughs> able to learn from your handshakes and then create its own, oops, <laughs> create its own handshakes based on its experiences with you. Is that free will? Is that like, wh- how do you define free will? I, I mean, uh, if if we had a, a fully, uh, like a, a concept of fully free will, we could just do whatever we imagined, yeah. right? Yeah. Fly or change shape or um, age up and down, just, you know, magic. We don't, our will is constrained based on physical principles. Mm-hmm. So we don't have what's, what, you know, is, is free will in the yeah. f- sense of free. Yeah. Um, but but we have an ability to make choices and the ability to make mistakes. Um, and will AI replace that? That's what you're kind yeah. of wondering, yeah. right? Yeah. You imagine a future where we, we were joking, right? You have Amazon before, yeah. where Amazon predicts what you need and sends you the product before you even know you need to buy it. And, and if you say, I don't want this, they're like, no, you do want this. You need this. You need this. You might know this, but you need this. And we were also talking about how uh, some of these venture capital funds are starting to invest in AI agents. Mm-hmm. And some of these agents are handling all your social media, yeah. right? So you can imagine if this technology starts to really gain some traction, where you have a social media that's just full of AI talking yeah. to each other, where literally all the messages, all the replies, all the comments, all the likes are just yeah. AI gaming the algorithm. Yeah. And nobody even needs to bother writing real stuff anymore. Yeah. Because, fake, so to speak. because the AI knows what we want to see more than we do and is able to game these um, algorithms so much better than we are uh, to, to like basically make it a playground for, for robots. Um, what happens in that case? What happens when our, we were joking about sex robots, but I don't think, I don't think this is a joke, man. I think uh, like if we can get that cost low enough mm-hmm. and you get, uh, AI to basically inhabit a humanoid robot that can look exactly like you want with all the, you know, the fine I mean, details. Some cost analysis, you know, I buy this robot for, we'll say $200,000, but I never have to pay for a date and have to do this and have to do that. No divorce. Yeah, just, you know, <laughs> keep my money, you know, and this, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and I mean, yeah. So the robot, you, you think maybe it'll be too nice and, We'll miss some of that, you know, pushback, but that's not hard to program either. Oh, yeah. You can you can have a little bit of pushback in the robots as well, and suddenly, like you have a question: like, Why do we why do we need um, why do we need human interaction yeah. anymore? Like uh, Tom back to Rick and Morty is an episode where you we went back to time, like one is like, one is reality, right? And so when it's, it's, he was married before his wife died. He probably like this robot, like this voice to be like his wife, right? Mm-hmm. Like knowing as fuck, push yeah. your back, like you suck, you know, yeah. like blah, blah, blah. Like, oh, 
Now I know I never come back here. <laughs> I, I programmed you too good, right? <laughs> let me get me get the hell out of here, you know? Yeah, exactly. I mean, in that kind of world, like what 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 are we what are we living for? Like when we can have AI replace a lot of our human experiences and um and human needs, like basically satisfy them to a T. What what is free will in that sense? Are we just ready is, for the metaverse? Is at it that really point? free will? It's like people tell you do over and over again, right? You remember the movie The Matrix? Yeah. When Neo comes and meets Agent Smith for the mm -hmm. first time in that high rise and Agent Smith tells him, we've actually created six simulations mm -hmm. in the past. Yeah. And unfortunately, you didn't buy it when we made it perfect. Yeah. We made a perfect world and you hated it. Yeah. So we made this world where there's some uncertainty and challenges and that's where we are. That's the matrix. Um, so in a sense, maybe, you know, <laughs> you have in history, you have these big collapses, like the Mayan civilization yeah. disappeared. Um, in a sense, we can imagine a world where it's just no reason to live in it anymore. No reason to engage with it anymore. You just, it's just there to maximize your desires and wants and plug every hole that you didn't even know you had. Have you heard this? I have no idea if it's true or not. I should actually research this. But well, supposedly the Matrix and Terminator are, are tied together. The person, one person wrote both of those stories supposedly and they're tied together. Really? Yeah, I got to research that. I have not heard yeah, that. Matter of fact, we can get that back. I know the Wachowskis, who are now the Wachowski sisters, if I'm not mistaken, or previously the Wachowski brothers. Um, I, I'm pretty sure they wrote The Matrix, but we might have to double check. Despite being very different films, both Terminator and the Matrix explore the idea of a future which machines take over. I'm pretty sure, I want to say the same person wrote a book, but I don't know. Terminator and the Matrix. Oh, Google's getting smarter. Oh, and shit. There you go. I didn't make it up. Yeah, no, I mean, I think uh, they, they come from the same kernel yeah. of, of thought, but the authors are, are different. No, it's, no it's, it's, it's the same author. This one lady wrote it. I, I think she's in front of a... Oh, no. Yeah, you're right. So Sophie Stewart claims her 1981 unpublished book called Third Eye, blah, blah, blah. Formed the basis. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So there's something to it, but not as much as I think. Yeah, no, I mean, I think we we have uh, this, this habit of standing on the shoulders of giants, mm -hmm. right? Where yeah. a lot of the greatest work comes from smaller works yeah. that people have created with original thought, which are also based on previous things and we're building on top of what happened in the past. So without a doubt, there's, you know, they, they come from the same root. Um, I, th I think that, yeah, we're, we're exploring some really uncharted terrain now. Another thing too, like, like people don't realize how far advanced we've come, right? Like I listen to one podcast, this guy, like, it's unbelievable. I've come from playing Pong to AI, right? In one generation, right? Yep. I mean, what's the word where like you double everything, like everything's like double, double, double. Moore's like, law. Yes. Yeah. Like people don't realize that's a real deal, right? In, in everything, right? So far, it's been we're getting, it's like, been holding we're, constant. We're yeah. not like gone back in, in advancement, except I, I guess we're back in the day when the the library of uh, Alexandria got destroyed, we lost all the knowledge. Right. But of course, we're back in time then. But usually, like, like you get smarter, smarter. Yeah, tech gets better. It's it's some amazing things, amazing things going on. Yeah, for sure. There's I mean, some scary shit going on too. They also say that the whatever we have now in the mainstream consciousness that the the military is about 20 years ahead of us oh yeah you know yeah. and uh, we I, I mentioned briefly right where did the internet come from it's a invention of the pentagon yeah, you know pentagon, department yeah. of defense yeah. uh, all, all those those guys so um they've had ai technology for quite a while now oh, yeah. they've been experimenting with it and like, yeah. i mean in a certain sense I don't think that we can release AI into the public without having the stamp of approval yeah. from the Department of Defense. Yeah. Like they need to know that terrorists or whatever yeah. bad actors aren't going to be able to use this act to reverse engineer a nuclear bomb, yeah. for example, right? Or create some sort of death laser, you know? Yeah. Um, and with the military, like all that, you hear all these, all these UFO signs, right? Is it UFOs or is this the military doing stuff, right? Can, mm. I, can you remember when the South, when the South bomber first came out back in the like late 90s, whatever it was? Like, yeah. it was amazing. Oh, shit. 
Now everyone has to have technology, right? So what's the next level? You, you know? know, I'm a cynic. I'm a cynic. I always think that like you've seen that movie Wag the Dog. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where, you know, in news cycles and media reporting, there's there's sometimes it's, you know, genuine, but other times it's like you play the hype to distract from other things yeah, that are exactly. going on. Like uh, I don't know who who was uh, who who it was that was reporting on that submarine, but apparently the the um, the the White House knew that it was a lost cause yeah. early on, you know, and rest in peace to to everyone involved. But then you're you're kind of milking this unfortunate event yeah. to distract from certain other things, like maybe Hunter Biden's. Yeah, I mean, what is the real or, news story, right? Right, exactly, exactly. And you know, maybe there's like a I don't know. Another the deadly disease being manufactured somewhere that can be reported on, right? Right, right. And then what? 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 What's important to one person might be important to someone else, right? Exactly, exactly. Like, you know, maybe a famous singer dies over the news. Like, I didn't like your music. Why? Why more than this? You know, like of course all the local stuff going to different cities and stuff. You know, and it's almost like there's so much information out there, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like, no one knows what's important to you. I don't know. It's drowning in information. That's for sure. And how do you like decipher it and do all that stuff? Yeah. Yes. I don't know. Sometimes I think ignorance is bliss, right? Yeah. Well, like like we were talking earlier, the best of times, the worst of times, you know, there's a double edged sword. It's a two headed or two sided coin. Um, <laughs> what do we do? We just have to keep chugging along, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. So we met, I think, one thing, one, so one time I'd be an entrepreneur, maybe it's me, my, my, my time is that's all jacked up, right? Like mm -hmm. something happened two weeks ago. I think it happened a year ago. Mm -hmm. Something happened yesterday. Like, it's like my shit is like, like one time my wife asked me, do you know what day it is? I said, yeah, what day is it? It's the day that ends with a little Y. <laughs> like, what else do you know, right? <laughs> but we met like recently on a, on a, on a boat cruise with W, it was a uh, Stop 253. Uh, Maritime Blue. So why, what's the, why, why is it important like uh, us like get out of network, meet, meet new people? Yeah, no, I think uh, human interaction exposes you to different ideas and different people. You never know who you're going to meet. You never know um, if your meeting is going to turn into a podcast yeah. uh, in a few weeks or if you're going to suddenly get some revolutionary idea from, from somebody that transforms your business or if you're going to find your co-founder or somebody that's going to you know, build some things for your company that can really move your product along forward. I think networking is really important. Being open to different relationships and different people is really important. So talk about the importance of like balancing network and still working to come here. I think it's too many founders like spend too much time networking, spend too much time like building the product. How do you personally like, do that balance of doing both at the level you need to do based on what you're going on? <laughs> it depends on it depends on how hungry you are. <laughs> that's that's a damn good point. I'm just kidding. If you're I'm hungry, kidding. go find a networking <laughs> event. Maybe he's gonna have some fucking slices of pizza and beer for you. Yeah. I'm just joking. No, I think um I mean if if you can rationalize being able to spend the time if you can justify it in your own way, that might be good enough. If you've got things that need your attention, they don't go, yeah. don't go. Um, if you're running a business, you're making money and you're, you know, you have things that you need to be doing. Don't go to the networking event. And one thing I feel don't realize the part of the networking event is not meeting your co-founder, meeting people, right? It's the ability to like, like build talent for your company, right? In my mind, I have a list of people I'm in network events. Like, okay. I want to hire that person. Yeah. You know, so I, I think, it's good for like recruiting people too, right? Yeah, now. absolutely. For sure. I met, I met uh, somebody who's um, building some really cool stuff for, for us at a networking event. And in a way that I didn't expect to happen, it was an NFT event. And this person is now working on a Unity app for us. So um, it, it's, it's awesome to also, I think another thing that maybe is important to mention, exposing your idea to other people, getting their reactions, um, gives you some sort of feedback to perfect what you're working on yeah. and to, to move in a direction maybe that you weren't even thinking of or to move away from a direction that you wanted to go in but realize maybe that's not the path. Yeah, it was more like whenever you meet someone, you got to push a button and like give the spill over again. Like, like, damn, I said this a thousand times. I'm tired of saying this. Well, you got to say it a thousand more times, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, right? but you don't say it the same way. Oh no, you don't. Yeah, every single interaction well, changes you your pitch. Hopefully you don't, right? Yeah, I mean, hopefully you get to a point where when you say it, people get it and yeah. you perfect you, you it. You see the light, the light bulb, and the head break. Oh, so you're doing that, right? Yeah, but sometimes they're like looking like, you, "What the fuck are you even doing? Like, <laughs> you, you're gonna sell what? Like, there's like, can you imagine back in the day when like Airbnb went to someone and say, 
yeah, I want you to sell your uh, space in your home because Brandon Strange was like, uh, no, no, <laughs> no, no, not doing that. But now it's like, you know, pretty much, Brandon, you know, everyone does. Yeah. That. And, and whole business models are built around that. Yeah. People's livelihoods are built around people renting out on Airbnb. That, yeah. And if Airbnb fails, suddenly a lot of people are going to be. Oh, yeah. A lot of people depend. I know I have a cousin, like, she's retired in her 70s and she has like three Airbnbs in her house, right? Mm -hmm. Like different. And that should be how she makes a living, right? Yep. That, there's a dry option. I don't know what she would do. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. That's what I think about it. We're living now. There's so much ways to make money now, right? Yeah. I mean, if it comes, it comes, first comes to service, you work for DoorDash. Right. Right. I or mean, Uber. There's so much ways they can make money nowadays, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, like, yeah. So there's always ways to make money. Well, that's the other thing is like AI is coming around. We got these, these, uh, um, now you don't even need to hire a graphic artist or, um, even a, a, a blueprint designer, like a lot of these AI uh, uh, programs can prototype for yeah. you now, like create blueprints for working prototypes. I've seen people use mid journey specifically for that. Uh, it, and and it, to the point where you hand them off to an engineer and they, they can create a patentable uh, blueprint in, you know, a, a tiny fraction of the time it would take. Um, so, so yeah, you have this concept that AI is going to take some jobs, maybe create some new ones, but maybe take more than it creates. What's, what's your take on UBI? Yeah, that's You're, exactly where I was going with this. So basically income that, take on that. It's exactly where I was going with this. I think, um, yeah, th this is a tough question. Uh, people love the idea of free money. <laughs> I think, uh, that's a universal truth, right? Talking yeah. about well, universal. Of course, nothing's ever free. Someone always pays a price. Yeah. So yeah, if we get farmed out for our data or farmed out for our eyeballs or whatever, maybe that's, we what, deserve. What's the other time? If it's free, you're the product, something like that. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's the thing, right? If it's free, you're the product. Yeah. Right? So you can't get mad that on your data, we use all the stuff for free. Yeah. Yeah. And it might, that that's the thing we were talking about sex robots and free will. These are all, all connected universal basic income. And are we the product? Are we going to be a uh, experience farm? Yeah. You know, where uh, we, we just, um, our our own interaction with tech and interaction with ideas and um, art is then the product. Yeah. Oh, you see all the time on like on Facebook, some are posts. I, I, I can't believe Facebook's still in my data doing this and this is not fair. Where's privacy? And the next day, I'm having dinner in Chick Fil A with my family. Blah blah. blah we're going here like you just don't get it right. <laughs> you don't see how these two things connected, right? You're actually providing to even make it easier for them to get the data for you, right? Right. And then you're wondering how they're sending you Chick-fil-A ads. Yeah. Or whatever, like, right? I just had Chick-fil-A. Why am I eating this? I again? was talking about this on my phone and now the ads are here. Yeah. Or even worse, uh, you're at your like your 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 parents' house and they love like a certain type of toothpaste that you don't use. And also you're flooded with a toothpaste ads, right? Yep. Yep. I, the the crazy thing is like at a certain point, the AI is AI models are going to be able to know who you are almost better than you in certain yeah. ways, you know, where um, I think it was somebody was uh, talking about how about 15 years ago, Google was able to identify when a woman was pregnant and send her ads for strollers and diapers and stuff before she even knew. So imagine this happening, right? This is like, this is a totally fucked up thought, right? Suppose like, Google knew, knew like a lady was pregnant, but not by her husband. And they sent a message to her husband. Did you know your wife's pregnant? Yep. And like, uh, but it's not by you or some crazy shit like that. Yeah. Oh, fuck. That's scary. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, oh, the, no, the, divorce, the divorce lawyer sends it to the husband. Do you know your wife's husband? I mean, you know your wife's pregnant. You, are you looking for a divorce? Call me up. Right, right, right. Are you looking for a divorce? And he, he uh, thinks everything's fine. But um, no, I mean, this is uh, this brings up some some uh, uh, really really interesting and kind of uh, scary ideas in a way. So back to UBI, I'm probably gonna slam with this, but my mind, do we already have UBI? So like we have welfare in the United States, right? Welfare of the war. Is it welfare sort of UBI? Well, look, uh, we had some experiments with UBI in the United States. People don't think about it this way, but the COVID payouts were that's an experiment yeah. with UBI. Yeah. That's yeah. let's call it what it is. Um, and yeah, there's, there's uh, some complex economic math that goes into it that, you know, are we going to ha have inflation from this? Mm -hmm. Are people going to lose their motivation to work? Like yeah. how are we going to motivate people to do anything? What's the effect on mental health? Yeah. Um, uh, are people going to be like, you know, 
is there going to be an uptick in suicides, for yeah. example, or, or scary things like that? Yeah, people um, need to be around people, right? Yeah, and people need to feel fulfilled. People yeah. need to feel like they're. It can be fulfilled if you're getting paid two thousand dollars a month just to fucking watch Rick and Morty cartoons all day long. You're wrong. I love Rick and Morty, but I don't know how I can watch them all day long every day for the rest of my life. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And then, like you know, it's only certain action. Like so, on the Myers Briggs, I'm on FJ, right? It's like, suppose there's like one or three percent of us, right? So I'm, I'm introvert, introvert, right? Even me during COVID, like, fuck, I got to talk to somebody, some of my wife. Like, I got to see someone else, right? This is fucking ridiculous, right? Yeah. So even me as an introvert, introvert, like, man, I got to fucking talk to someone besides my wife and kids. Like, yeah. So social interaction is a big thing, which I think be a negative for UBI, right? Mm-hmm. And then do, do you do some of UBI, like, you know, like make paintings and make poetry, all that kind of stuff, right? Like, it's, I don't know. Yeah. That, again, I mean, um, if, if you can have an AI that is programmed to fit you like a glove for, to make you convinced that it's your best friend, your yeah. lover, your um, partner in crime, yeah. your, you know, uh, equal, your peer, yeah. that you can have fulfilling interactions with a, a machine yeah. in a way that satisfies you. Even if you know it's not real, like even on, if you on know. the matrix, that guy like went to the other side, he like, I know this takes fake. I know it's not real, but man, I'm enjoying this, right? Yeah, exactly. Right, right. So is there, it, it might be real to you, you know, in those fake, you know? Yeah. At that point, like, um, if we can create a technology that, that really understands the core of a person and is able to make us suspend our disbelief that that's a machine. Yeah. Then it, it, it see going back into the whole concept of free will and the concept of um, human interaction. What do we need? Is it necessarily a bad thing? I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. And then how do laws keep up? Like, suppose you're like, you know, there's actually drivers cars in the future, right? And you're in the backseat of the car because you're fucking drunk as shit, and you get pulled over just because it's, it's like, a, like a traffic checkpoint, right? You pull over, you in the backseat. The car's driving like 50 miles an hour, nothing to say, but you're drunk as shit. Like, you're not driving, but you're in the car, right? Are you controlling the car? Is, it, is the Tesla, is like, like, how do they work those kind of things, right? And then, like, there's a big thing about maybe, like, making all, like, truck drivers, like, like drivers, right? It's, it's probably a good thing, right? But, like, do we really need, I, I think there's 250,000 truck drivers in the United States, right? Like, we're supposed money, 250,000 truck drivers, and I don't have a job, right? I'm mm-hmm. I mean, the impact, the repercussion economy is, like, fucking mind-blowing, right? Yeah. All the people depend on them. It's like, and you can't buy those people for two thousand dollars a month. No, uh, to truck driving, they they can make a lot more money than that. Oh yeah, definitely right. So how do you? I think a lot of things. I just think a lot of things people are not thinking through, right? Yeah, no. It, there, there's a lot of experimentation going on, and some of the European countries are ahead uh, in kind of this universal basic income stuff. Like Switzerland and Finland, yeah. they're experimenting a yeah. lot with UBI. Um, and then what do you do to get kicked off UBI? Like, oh, you're going to give UBI. Social credit score, man. You yeah. say something about Hunter yeah. Biden that the government doesn't like, boom. Yeah, yeah. It just gets cut off. Point. Yeah, like you're doing UBI, but you're not doing this. We're going to cut you down. It's like, and then like, to me, it's just, I'm sure people don't think it's welfare. It's basically welfare, right? The government's paying you to do something. It, it, I don't know. It's like good times, bad times, you know, like scary thoughts. Yeah, I mean, you ever watch that cartoon Wally? You remember that? I remember the Wally with the yeah. robot. Yeah, yeah. Where uh, I don't, I don't know if you remember seeing it, but uh, their their vision of the future is humans on spaceships where everybody's fat and just stuck in their phones. Yeah. They're like floating around on these uh, levitating wheelchairs. They're super obese and just stuck in their phones all the time. Um, is that like prophetic? You know, is that like a, a a vision of what the future could actually bring us with this UBI track. Um, and then we start looking back at this metaverse stuff and this matrix concept of plugging into a virtual world where there is challenge and uncertainty and, um, we, we go back to the stone ages to, to do all this stuff. For or a world where we're in the, the Roman era, yeah. Uh, and, and like you want to eat, you better hunt down some. You better hunt exactly, some exactly. Where and and who knows? Maybe maybe there's this infinite loop of um, of 
really fast technological development, downloading yourself into a simulation and starting from the ground up until we get to this point again, where, um, where we're back in another simulation starting over. And there's this kind of like Russian nesting doll effect of <laughs> <laughs> and Rick and Morty's uh, you, you bring them up all the time. They, they did this episode where there's a simulation within a simulation within a yeah. simulation um, is that so far from the truth? I don't know. I mean, it would be super interesting if we had a, a, a virtual world where we could literally choose our experience. Um, you know, imagine like a, um, instead of Amazon prime where you're selecting videos or different movies, it's like a metaverse prime yeah. where you have the Roman era and, and, you know, uh, the Jetsons yeah. and uh, I want to be a soldier of Roman times. I yeah. want to be Cleopatra's, you know, manservant or right. I want to, you know, I want to be, you know, no gold rush. Yeah. Or maybe there's an AI that just automatically detects what you want and forms a metaverse experience around that. That's so realistic that, you know, it's just that scratch for you. Talk, talking about like something like the holodeck and the Star Trek enterprise. Right. Right. So one thing I'm a big believer, if you can imagine it can be done, right. Yep. I'm a big believer in that. Right. To an extent, maybe like I went to one pitch competition. This guy, his, he wanted to build an escalator to the moon. Oh yeah. 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 So Michael I, Lane. Yeah. Yeah. Escalator moon. Like, man, I don't know about that one. That's going to be hard to imagine. Right. But I, I, generally, I think if you can imagine it can be built, right. Yeah. yeah. Everything that's been done in the past, someone imagined it. Right. You know, Liftport, Liftport's uh, ideas are actually pretty, pretty advanced mm -hmm. at this point. Um, they've got some really interesting, not only schematics and blueprints and stuff, but like a whole video about how it can be done. It's super cool. Yeah. Um, you should have him on here. Have you have you talked to him here? Before? No, I haven't. I, I haven't met him. He has a, a podcast too that that he that he runs. I know him pretty well. I'm happy to introduce. Yeah, yeah. What's his name again? Michael Lane. Okay, I need to meet him. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's amazing like stuff people are doing. So this is this a, a startup called Avalanche Energy out of Kent or Renton. Okay. And so they want to do. It's like one of those things. Like, it's like man, you, you pull this off, we're uh, like the energy crisis solved, but if you pull it off, we might be fucked, right? <laughs> they basically want to give everyone like a Tony Stark nuclear pack. Cool. So you have all right here, all your own energy, like little pack. So all the energy be just in your hand, right? It was like shit. I don't I know. Like if, I, I don't know if I trust the majority of people with fucking nuclear energy in their fucking hands. Yeah, I feel like you need to have some sort of like Elysium system. Yeah. You remember that movie Elysium? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, where you've got like a a small percentage of society that's super wealthy and connected to everything and has all the rights, mm -hmm. and then you have the rest of society that's just like yeah. living in hovel poverty, whatever. Um, I don't know. I mean, that's another question that I wanted to bring up with you, right? So. Um, we, we're looking at different types of futures and I imagine a future where instead of trying to protect data and, you know, keep customer data safe, you've got all these hacks, you've got all these, uh, different types of data breaches and vulnerabilities and stuff. Imagine a future where everything is open source, where me and you sitting across from each other, you can look at me and know exactly what's in my bank account all the last text messages I've sent with all the last pictures in my phone, uh, basically where, where you have um, equal and unfettered access to everyone else's life around yeah. you. What? So um, yeah, on the one hand, you have a lot less costs yeah. for security um, and a lot of transparency, which makes it a lot easier to to do business to find friendships and partnerships however comma <laughs> yeah 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 there was an episode this is a show called you're me and you right i'm sure it's nasty yo it's like futures and stuff okay and one of the things like you know in the future we were to read people's minds right mm -hmm. we had to, we had opt-in right so there's one family everyone can read my step as father right i don't do that shit right but then he found like opted in because he would have constant involvement right and it was like but there's no filter right so Someone walked in your room and you said, that's the ugliest person in my life. That person <laughs> automatically know you thought that, right? Yeah. So, like, how do you protect that filter, right? Because, like, people don't admit this, but we all think things that you would never say out loud, right? Yep. But most people are not. You're not thinking, like, oh, my goodness. I got to listen to this bullshit again. Like, yeah. Oh, my God. Like, my wife's going to say this, you know? Like, yeah. Can you see this person, right? And it's, it's, it's mean spirited, but you don't sit because that, it's part of your brain. Like, you know, like, that, not the ego, what it's called, like, the real negative, right? Right. And, you, and you're like, thank God he said it loud. 
Yeah. Or even the case where like, oh shit, did I say it out loud? Yes, you said it out loud. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, you know. It's yeah, it's, it's oh, like shoot, man. I gotta figure out my parking situation. Sorry. Right. You wanna go take off and we do the parking or what you wanna do? Um I don't know. Let me take a break or whatever. Oh yeah, let's take a break. I'll I'll yeah. renew my parking and okay. run back. Is right. that cool? Yeah. I should have done that a while ago. Right. It's like a half hour. We'll be right back. So we're, we're, he's going to do this probably We'll be all right in a minute. <laughs> After break. Oh, I got to get some back in. Oh, thank you. I'm just right off. All right, so we're back. That's one thing I gotta figure out how to do that better, right? So the street parking is like two hours. Yeah. And then like the fucking parking garage costs too much money. So I gotta figure out a better way to do that. So here's a question for you. So you're a founder, you're time limited, right? Mm. I'll use an example, right? You came to the podcast, you're using be two, three hours. So what, you live in Seattle, or you live in Tacoma, right? Yeah. You gotta get here. So how do you determine like what is worth your time to do versus what's not worth your time? It's kind of just intuition. Okay. Um, I am curious because there's a lot of things that have happened in my life where you can't predict what happens when you attend something or when you meet with someone or when you do a podcast or a TEDx, for example, right? And it uh, kind of like dominoes into something bigger that you can't predict. So I don't know who's watching. I don't yeah. know. What yeah, I can tell you plenty of time people can be, hey, Jason. We did a podcast two years ago, but someone saw my YouTube video and they bought something from me, right? Yeah. I mean, it's never, and then with podcasts too, they're hit and miss, right? Like some are good, some are bad. I was on one podcast, there's 30 minute podcast. And the guy, I talked for one minute. The guy I talked the whole time, like, dude, why am I even here, right? So it's definitely hit and miss, right? But yeah. thanks for coming, I really appreciate it. 
yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's like build new relationships and have a good time. Um, but if, if you feel like it's something that, that could be interesting, yeah. um, I, I'm not just doing this for business or making mm, money yeah. or something like that. I like in, having conversations, yeah. I like talking about philosophy yeah. and AI and technology and simulation. That's fun for me. So part of it's also, you know, yeah, the ability for me to dump uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. stuff a, off of my chest. and Exactly, yeah. yeah. So have you done like any like incubators, accelerators? Yeah, I was in WTIA. I'm still in WTIA. So you're, you're in the number nine one? Yes. Okay, I was in number eight. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Nice. So that's why you're in the Slack. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice. And um, uh, Startup 253 in Tacoma. Okay. And a accelerator called CPG, okay. which is remote. Uh, they're crypto focused. So is it? Is there such thing in too many accelerators? That's a good question. I mean, it depends on what your goal is from the accelerator. It's so, like a lot of them just do the same thing. Like they do the basic stuff, get you ready. And then like, do they really help you get sales, you know? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think for me, it wasn't as much about the uh, information from the accelerators, even though a lot of it was really valuable, um, but more about the networking yeah. and um, you know, WTA, they expose you to some of the, the biggest investors in this area. Yeah. Um, and, and put you on calls with these guys where yeah. you can ask questions and get face to face, even with in-person meetings. And just the fact that connect with Dave Parker, like, yeah, I think that alone, Dave Parker alone is like the worth of whatever it is you got to, you know, the cost, you know? Yeah. He's awesome. I love Dave Parker. He's smart. He's funny. He's like witty and yeah. uh, genuinely really helpful, cares about business, knows how to make the business work. Uh, so that that's been great. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, also pitching. With the accelerators, you pitch at yeah. the end uh, or at various points in the journey. Mm -hmm. And no matter what, I, personally, I believe pitching every opportunity to pitch oh, yeah. in front of an audience, especially in front of investors or yeah. anybody who's like, you know, more than just your average Joe yeah. is valuable. No matter what, you'll take something valuable from that experience. I believe too. So the pitch conference I'm doing, I'm, I'm kind of doing it different. So what I want to do, and this might be kind of weird. So like, a lot of people come to like, like founders live. Yeah. It's 99 seconds, right? Yep. With mine, it's going to be like minimum three max of fire, right? Mm -hmm. And you can do whatever you want to, right? You can have drones, you can fly around a drone, do a product demo. Cool. And so I have like the judge is going to be Byron Robs. He's like sponsoring it. He's like a product equity banker. Karina is going to be a judge. I like Karina. Yeah, she's cool. Big fan of her. And then a friend of mine, Christina Brennan, she's like a communication coach. She used to be the pitch coach for uh, founders live, right? Oh, interesting. But now she's like, full-time comic in the Denver area, right? Oh, But nice. she's actually going to be here in July to, to do the judging, right? So cool. we're, we're judging. And what I'm thinking about doing, like, picking, like, just a random person, right? Uh -huh. Like, you go on the list of people, like, always be, like, pick some random person. Has no knowledge of startups, nothing, yeah. right? That's the actual consumer, right? Uh-huh. And, and have them have a part of it, too, right? Yeah. Because so many times you pitch, like, VCs, and they say the same thing, right? You need traction. You need this. This is too early. Right? Yeah, this That's is too a... early. Yeah, it's too early, right? I want, like, an actual consumer, right? Like, so I hope it goes off well. Now, do you need somebody else to pitch? No, actually, no one's applied yet. Oh, really? Do you? Yeah. I'm, I'm happy to do it if you want. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. So I was talking, I was talking with Karina yesterday. Either we're going to have like 100 people attending, 50 people apply to pitch, or we're going to have like a, a fucking total disaster. <laughs> yeah. Think about these events I've done in the past. Like, you know, you might have like 50 people RSVP, only 10 show up. Mm -hmm. Only RSVP, like 50 people show up. Like, you never really know, right? Yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's hit and miss. It's hit and miss. And that, that one's going to be in Tacoma, though, right? Yeah. The, yeah. The, 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 the place in the water that Karina works at. I want to see, you talk to those Ziva guys, um, the um, vertical takeoff and landing drone people. Mm -hmm. That's a cool company. Okay. Based in Tacoma. Okay. Uh, I'd really like to see their pitch. I wonder okay. if if you can get yeah. that one. Yeah, that's why I, I want an all-star, three guards, face, small business. I just want to, like, you know. And of course, the goal is like the first four people we pick, like maybe some of you don't know that good, right? Yeah. To make it fair, but I don't know. I think Michael Lane would also, from Liftport, the okay. moon elevator guy would also be down. Nice. Yeah. They want to make, make it a good event, right? Yeah. Of course, you know, I get value. I get, you know, I get people's emails, addresses, you know, so it's Kevin's HR, you know, so those are something to be said about it. So moving on, to me, some exciting really recently happened, right? But they discovered something called Gravity Chaser Waves mm -hmm. that does actually, the universe has background music. Mm. like what the fuck <laughs> uh, you know part of me can't help but think that you're just trying to interpret something out of numbers yeah that maybe you have to stretch your imagination mm. a little bit 
some of the people in the scientific community are really good at like packaging yeah the so get findings so to get future funding yeah exactly and to drive a hype cycle sell their books mm-hmm. also you know that's a big one um I'm not saying that that's the case yeah. but th- this sounds like one where okay you have a random pattern and if yeah. you you know put apply a certain equation on it yeah. you can have it sound like tupac <laughs> yeah yeah that's true yeah <laughs> It's so exciting, nevertheless, right? It gives us something to talk about. That For sure. Some people don't give a fuck about it. Like, oh, who cares? Yeah. Like, some people are like, shit, I don't know where my next meal's coming from. I don't, who cares right. about the music having a, the right. universe having a sympathy, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, having sympathy, that's a that's a big question. And maybe, maybe, maybe it's uh, actually, you know, there's um, elevator music that's playing in the server room where the simulation's being processed. Exactly, right? <laughs> you have our work, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then like, um, there's so much stuff going on in the universe, right? Like we don't know, right? Like, yeah. Well, I think Dumb, Donald Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense back they say, we don't, the unknown knowns, unknown unknowns, yep. we don't know, we don't know, right? It's true, right? You don't know, you don't know, we don't know. Yeah, that's true. Sometimes you know what you don't know, Yeah, which is, <laughs> it's pretty mysterious in and of itself. But I'm the kind of person where it's like, if I'm not there, I'm not going to believe it. Yeah, without a, a healthy dose of skepticism. Well, I think this type of knowledge, I can't remember describe as a knowledge where like, as a knowledge where like, you know if two people were there, right? Yeah. Like, for example, infer knowledge, right? So like, like China, I know China exists because people know it exists, right? Yep. But have I actually been to China? No. Same. Like, is China exists? Probably so, but do I really know it exists, right? Yeah. I mean, with, with certain things, you have some, uh, like even... Netflix has dramas from China that has Chinese dress and the Chinese language where you can watch it and you can be like, okay, this, this looks real. Mm -hmm. doesn't look completely made up. These people are speaking completely foreign language. They seem to be understanding each other. They're dressed in ways that I've never seen before. Maybe, you know, but um, then when when you talk about space, especially right. uh, A lot of the, the, um, the news cycle is driven by equations from, complex machines that are gathering information in ways that are really difficult for the average person to understand. And then you have scientists who work with PR companies that are experts at packaging it up into sexy news bites. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, what is it have exactly? The, have the sexy blonde or frog dress delivering it, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You remember this happened a while ago where were like the Department of Defense, the Pentagon, this is like out of the blue, UFOs might exist. Like, wait, what? What did you just say? We, we, we repeat that UFOs might exist elaborate a little bit more Pentagon, right? Yes, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Again, I can't help, but think that some of those things are like you say UFOs might exist. It's one of those non-committal things where you don't, you don't have to go into greater depth, mm-hmm. right? You can just like, why do you think that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's classified. Right. Yeah. This conversation's over. Sorry. Um, but you know, uh, at the same time, you've got wag the dog type stuff going on where you're trying to distract from certain things and maybe, you know, you're trying to work something else, uh, that, that you need more privacy over. So I can't help but be spect- uh, skeptical whenever we have big news like that, allegedly, you know, what's your take on genetic splicing? Well, um, it seems like there's already um, some benefit to it. It seems like if you're rich enough, you can make sure that your baby doesn't have certain genetic diseases already. You hear about the case in China where that one Chinese thing um, did it where the this girl will never get AIDS or something? Yeah, the, there's some, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know how true any of this is. I heard about something from China where a woman got lots of plastic surgery and ended up marrying a uh, a wealthy person. I remember, yeah, I know that, yeah. And then the baby was ugly. Their babies ended up being really ugly and he sued her yeah. and ended up winning somehow. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, how do you sue somebody for that? Right, right. So, I mean, she didn't marry him with false pretenses, you know, I guess, you know. If you've got enough money anyway, you can make things happen, I guess. Yeah. Um, is it? Look, people are changing their hair color. People put in contacts to change their eyes. People wear clothes to change their appearance or add tattoos, yeah. right? We there, There's a lot of reasons why we're not happy with the roll yeah. of the dice that nature gave us or whatever. And, uh, you know, you have also this kind 
kind of trends where people aren't happy with their gender identity or, or whatever. And, and I think it's, it's human nature to try to change ourselves in a way that kind of fits who we think we are. Um, and genetic tools are kind of uh, going to be a, an important way to do that. Yeah. Cause even the, the COVID vaccines, right. They, they were also genetic tools that were uh, created in, in labs where um, they're, they're mRNA vaccines. So they, they pump proteins in yeah. your body that actually produce cells, produce certain proteins in your body that are supposed to fight the, the virus. Um, and I mean, there's a lot of pushback that these are experimental and, you know, how did we get these through? There was emergency uh, authorization. Why didn't we just use traditional vaccines? Yeah. That's legitimate for sure. But at the and same course, time, the thing is like, if you do a vaccine in six months, how can we can do this all the time? Yeah. 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 And I mean, maybe that's, maybe there's also a lot of really important data that was gathered about how these vaccines, uh, these tools actually biological tools interact with our bodies yeah. so that we can release new products into the market where, you know, maybe if you get a shot, it'll change your eye color permanently yeah. or, or something crazy like that. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a biologist, but maybe, maybe that's now within the realm of possibility after kind of getting this early real life feedback on, how users actually react to this kind and of stuff. Like, let's suppose, like, I'll take an example. Like, I'm an introvert, right? But, like, man, being an introvert has been a struggle for my life. I don't want my kids to be an introvert, right? So, I want my, when I have a kid, I want the genetic splicing to decrease introversion and increase extroversion. But maybe, like, that's actual skill my kid needed, right? Or maybe, like, I'm 5'10, I want my kid to be 6'2. Like, how do you make those decisions for future generations, like, about genetic splicing? I think it's a tough skill, right? What well, have you seen the movie Gattaca? Remember that movie? I want to say I have. Sounds familiar. Gattaca is uh, exploring that topic where um, the protagonist is a, like, um, how do you describe it? Like a non-genetically manipulated human, whereas everybody else around this person is genetically designed, right? So every single other human being that works with this person went through is a designer baby, basically, where the, the genetics are handpicked. Uh, their intelligence is selected, their, all their traits are selected before they're born, and yet there's still some random element that gives people who haven't gone through this, this X factor that can yeah. be really good. Um, yeah, it seems like something that's going to be available to rich people, and it seems like something that's going to keep rich people rich. Yeah. <laughs> Here's one for you. Can you imagine how different the world would be if Julius Caesar could read minds? Like Julius Caesar could read minds, could read and group. Okay, all these people are going to try to kill me on March 13th, right? And he survived. How different the world would be? Or, yeah. or, or anybody, how different the world would be if anyone survived? Like maybe like the um, the library in Alexander was not destroyed, right? Or right. Maybe this happened or this happened, right? And this realize how my how like random the world is, right? Yeah. You're like five minutes late to meeting, meet someone else who does something for you, and then yeah. you meet your future wife or like that that movie, uh, Butterfly Effect. Yeah, Butterfly Effect, and the um, that movie with the uh, Brad Pitt, where he's like started old Benjamin Button. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, like he met his his wife because something happened, you know. Yeah. Life is so just so fucking random. People don't realize that. I don't think. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we can we can speculate um about all that. It's so hard to know. Like maybe the Julius Caesar path ended in world destruction, where we had to start over somehow. Yeah. Or maybe maybe we'd be you know there's a family guy episode where um stewie and brian went back in time and yet it looked so futuristic because it was a world without religion for yeah. example right yeah so uh, it's it's hard to know like would it actually have turned out that way i mean julius right? caesar they killed him because he's, he's like, this is gonna be a dictator maybe it was gonna become a dictator if i can kill a lot of people like it didn't matter anyway rome was ruled by dictators for 500 years after yeah. that yeah, you still have ain't that ain't that fucking crazy? You, you kill a dictator and you fucking ensure a dictatorship takes over. Yep, yeah, that is crazy, and I hope we don't have to walk that same path. Because I mean, wasn't Rome a republic for about so two hundred, three hundred years? I took a Roman history before? class in college, and we did a study, and we could and somehow we figured out like I'm currently gonna make it up right. The, we're on the same track of Roman history. I think we like, I took that class like 1994, and we figured out like in the year 2237. That we become a dictator. We're gonna have our own Julius Caesar coming yeah. up pretty soon here. Yeah, like all the things like point to right, like 
like you know like you know welfare systems you know the the, the caste systems all that kind of stuff right like lined up perfectly right there's More power there's definitely i mean we're pretty much a new power you know like back when rome took over all the countries that existed they came out of nowhere just like we did you know a lot of similarities now, was there somebody who did a study of like how many executive orders we have now compared to like 50 years ago oh yeah yeah if i'm not mistaken the amount of executive orders that we're issuing has increased a lot yeah a lot yeah um uh, and i mean if you're able to go around the the legislature like that, that kind of it's basically it's like a monocardi decree, right? Yeah, exactly. Right, right. So it, it seems like I mean the thing is, dictatorships have certain benefits sometimes. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's more efficient. You can get decision making done a, good a lot one. faster. Like imagine, I mean, can you imagine like one one dictator is like we'll say someone like Solomon, right? Yeah, like all known, all knowledgeable. But the next one's fucking Adolf Hitler. Like, oh right. shit, you know, like, or like, what was that guy, Caligula? Yeah. You know, Roman, it's like, remember his, like, they were like, had three great empires and then three harbor empires, right? It's like that rotation they went through all the time, right? Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. It's hard to say. I mean, um, deep in the past, like, even you were mentioning the battle of, uh, with, with Constantine, Emperor mm-hmm. Constantine, history is written, written by the victor. So, oh, yeah. Don't he could have really it. said whatever he wanted to. The battle could have been totally lopsided from the beginning. Yeah. And, and then after, Afterwards, you don't have anybody to, you know, argue. And then, like, you. like his story of like the Jesus in the sky, you know, all his men, you know, validated it. So, of if course, you're, if you're a random former soldier, are you gonna say no? He's fucking lying. Yeah, no, <laughs> you're not. Get the fuck out of here. No way. They will slaughter your whole family in front of you and then kill you afterwards, right? Yeah. No, they will kill you. They will like crucify you, let you die in the midnight sun, or whatever you know. Right? Uh, you know, there's fates worse than death sometimes oh, because yeah. uh, you, you don't have to kill somebody. You can just like make them a laughing stock or a yep. complete moron to society where nobody trusts them, believes no, them anymore. You can't make no money and before you know you're homeless. Yeah. And that's, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, I can't imagine. Hey, um, Jason, you're, you're, you're a Roman soldier working for cancer time. We don't believe this God in the sky. Oh my God. That, that's so true. I seen in my own eyes, you know, you really see your own eyes. Oh yes, of course I did. But you know, yeah. But what a great story, right? Yeah, for sure. For I mean, sure. what a great story, like to tell, to tell people like Jesus spoke to me. Like, well, yeah, I mean, of course, a hundred years before that, um, if I don't, if I remember correctly, that battle happened sometime around the, uh, uh, four hundreds, like that, yeah. but, but then a hundred years before that, you have the council of Nicaea, yeah. which uh, I think it was like 323 or 319, 325, yeah. uh, where, where you have all the bishops in the area come together and decide which books are, uh, approved to be in the Bible. Of course, influence on that probably too, right? Like, yeah. Like these, these bishops, are you really talking to Jesus? Is Jesus, is God really telling you what to do, right? Yeah, it's like this fucking other random dude, like put money in your pocket, right? Yeah, exactly. And now, a thousand years later, we follow this council, the especially if you're Roman Catholic, so to speak. The so we have the in Roman Catholic, we have like the catechism of the church, all yep. the different roles. Yep. So, of course, none of us in the Bible, you know, yeah, yeah, of course, right. And uh, so it's kind of like this approval process where you test the waters for for 200 years and then suddenly this thing's got mass adoption and you got to figure out what to do with it so you get this council of people who say uh, if we if we go with these books we should be all right yeah. you know and, um i know we should really say approve these 10 books but the Roman emperor has has like basically said if you approve these three books we're, it's gonna be hell on us right yeah yeah and then you know you've got certain interactions in there like i mentioned earlier given to caesar what caesar's yeah. we got to make sure these people are paying their taxes on time oh yeah we got to make sure that we teach them as part of their religion to do that right and so um you have this jesus figure who's um uh you know the, the savior of humanity and yet who also i can't help but say it but you know, spews some government propaganda now and yeah. again, where he's yeah. like, make sure you pay your taxes, folks. Yeah. And um, the, the, the Jesus story is, is like, people don't realize this. There's so many Jesus stories, right? Even before Jesus came, there's like different stories of virgin birth, like all these societies of virgin birth stories, all this kind of stuff, you know, like, and then I suppose like there's like all these prophets back in the day, right? And Jesus just was the one that came, came forth, you know, and like, no, the question back, you know, like, does God exist? Does he exist? Like, if you're God, why are you going to send your son, which is, is like, according to Chris, is actually part of you, right? Mm. To die for our sins. You just fucking like, okay, everyone gets in heaven, right? 
Yeah, I mean, look, we we can go and criticize different parts of Christianity till the cows come home. It's there's there's a lot of Let's fodder say, for that. Yeah. There's a lot of areas where it's like Buddhism, right. Islamic. There's always like you know, like, like the question of why sacrifices in the first place. Mm-hmm. Like, why do you need to butcher an animal or yeah. a human being to like your God doesn't want you anyway? For sins. It's it's like oh, and not to mention that all of the the tribes nearby are doing the same thing you yeah. know all over the world you've got egyptians and celts and yeah. hindus uh, who are slaying animals and, to appease and you talk their, about being lucky like gods you're jewish you're the chosen people like talk about being fucking lucky right yeah right right well to an extent of course they fucking you know the fuck they went through too you know so maybe they're not so lucky right yeah <laughs> luck i guess is in the eye of the beholder because or is it just a great story told by some jewish storyteller that's definitely a part of it. It has to be a good story. It yeah. has to be a good story. But I mean, going back to your point on luck, how do you, the, the story of the Jewish nation is really interesting because you have a, it, there are very few examples in history when um, a, a nation state gets destroyed and yet keeps their identity for <laughs> Yeah, thousands of years and then years. reconstitutes. I, I, I don't know if there's even a single example of that really. I could be wrong, but I think if you took the Jewish people in the year 800 BC to now, that we that we have so much in common, right? Yeah, Pretend, I mean that's hard to say, <laughs> but but the Taurus, the Taurus, you know, same stuff they do, you know. Right, right. But it, it's yeah, I mean, I mean, if nothing else, the Bible's a great story, right? Yeah. And another thing too, like you know, people say like once again, I'm, I'm more of a Catholic, I believe in God, but like stuff in the Bible, like you know, they'll say God never changes, right? Okay, so. The God in the Old Testament, like slaughtering and raping kids and children. In the New Testament, he's forgiving everyone for, everyone for everything, right? Yep. So how is it the same, right? Yeah. No, I mean, like I said, we can we can find, we can nitpick, we can, there's there's uh, two different genealogies of Jesus in, I think it's the book of Matthew and the book of uh, Mark, mm-hmm. where there are different names in there. Yeah. And the length is different, yeah. right? And, and so you're like, a second. And and people try to rationalize it in different ways. Yeah. And of course, there's like you know the that one language, another language translation, another language translation. Right. You know what gets what gets lost? A lot of stuff probably. But that that's again, that's not the most important thing. How how does your own personal relationship uh, affect your life and yeah. your your real world earthly relationships? Yeah. Um, and uh, there's a lot to be said on the positive the side. Day, are you a good person, right? Yeah, not right. exactly, exactly. Of course, one one good person might be a bad person somewhere else, right? Like we were talking about earlier, if you punch somebody in the face out of nowhere, it's a bad thing. But yeah. if you're punching them to defend your daughter, yeah, suddenly it's a good thing, right? So the yeah. same action in a different context is good or bad. And then different groups have different values, right? Like, I'm yeah, sure. I'm sure if you're like you're, you're a farmer in a farming community in Nebraska, your values are different from a mafia family in New York City, right? Right. Vastly different, I would think. And yet maybe more similar in ways that we don't want to admit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. Um, yeah. So what what do you what are some pros and cons about being an entrepreneur? Pros, you meet interesting people. You meet um, you know, people who have done amazing things with their lives, who have really cool careers. Uh cons, mental health. You you go through days when you're like, what am I doing? And you look at your own, uh, you know, company and you're like, I can't keep doing this. I need to make more money. And you, you realize that with, with your current CV, if you, if you have a, a founder title on your LinkedIn, you're never getting a job. Nobody's going to hire you. No. If you're a founder and you apply for a job, um, you need to hide that somewhere. Yeah. And if you've got it on your LinkedIn, it's like, I mean, people are going to look at that and they're going to say, why would we bring someone who's trying to start their own company? They're going to leave um, the, the second they get any traction or funding. Um, so it's like, you know, the mental health aspect of it and being uncertain about the future, especially when it comes to finances has been pretty tough for me, particularly. Um, yeah, I've been bootstrapping my company myself. We have some revenue, but trying to... <laughs> I have conviction that we're building the right thing, but then there's always that element of 95% of startups fail. And the chances are that I'm in that percentage. And so have I wasted all this time? Am I going to be able to go out and get a job that I feel like is going to be worth what, what I can bring to the table? 
Um, those are things that, that plague me for sure. So I joke sometimes. I know how they like. There's no such thing as failure. Only, only like learnings. Yeah. Like like I'm I'm fucking tired of learning. I want <laughs> I want to succeed. I'm fucking tired of learning these lessons. I want to be successful, right? Yeah. So what what's one thing like like right now like something in the past like you like you had trouble with like it was a challenge but now you're like how is that so hard for me that's just, that, I, that was so easy to do once i figured it out yeah um hmm coding coding yeah so it was one of those things that i always wanted to do and i think you're you're in the same, the same boat thing, as an yeah. as an entrepreneur you you deal with a lot of technology you have to and your product also has a lot of technology built into it um as as an entrepreneur or as a founder i guess entrepreneur is more positive is more like after you've already done it um as a founder you you're i'm i'm building a tech product and i have to know what it does i have to understand it on a very basic level cuz you don't um, want to be dependent on some random coder yeah. somewhere it does have your Company's right. interest in your heart. And this coder leaves, or even if they do have your interest at heart, if they're the coder leaves and suddenly, you know, you're testing the product and you encounter a bug and you have to bring somebody else in, they take a month to just study all the code yeah. before they identify what's wrong. And and you're like, oh, okay, wow, crazy. Um, but then being involved in the coding process and writing and deploying some of my own code yeah. has it's it's increased my self confidence. It's increased my skill set, and um, it's made me more sure of my own product and company. That's man. How do you find the time to do that? Right. I have to. That's one thing. I'm more more like, if you say you don't have the time, someone else is finding the time. Something like that. Yeah. How many hours of sleep you get per day when I have? I would say probably around six. Six. Yeah. Six to seven. Man, I, I have a friend. Of course, so like Elon Musk, famous, works hundred hours a week. I have a friend, Kyoki Kerr, like one of my best friends of life, right? He was my first roommate in the army. This dude sleeps four hours a day. I think, man, the shit I could get done at this if I was awake 20 hours. It was crazy. Like, he could go to, if he went to sleep at eight, he wakes up at midnight, right? His whole life, he'd be like drunk as shit. I mean, whatever case would be, four hours, right? I mean, what I could do with fucking 20 hours of work. But I, I need like seven to eight, seven to eight. Because so if I was six, supposed to be in the military, I don't, had to be sleep deprived, buddy, man. Like, it's definitely, of course, that's today's like, if you don't get enough sleep, it like degrades you over time. Oh, right? yeah. It makes your like life shorter, you know. But I mean, who knows, right? Right. Yeah. Of course, the thing is like, what are you doing with the time you're awake, right? Yeah, that's another big thing. Is like, uh, with me <laughs> as a founder in the entertainment space, um, sometimes you rationalize yourself consuming entertainment and saying, "Oh, this is for work," you know, yeah. where where I'm like consuming certain things in the entertainment space that actually it's it's fun it's recreation but i i justify it to myself saying oh i'm i'm researching yeah. i'm doing market research you know yeah. um well i mean it, it always is and it's not false yeah. it's it's a true thing but but do you need to spend two hours doing it versus 10 minutes do i need to yeah or like you always like before you go i'll just look at one tiktok video next day oh shit it's two in the morning yeah i think some of it also goes back to the mental health where yeah. sometimes um sometimes you're fired up and you're like i'm gonna change the world i'm yeah. gonna to build things that people love i'm gonna make so much money i'm gonna be famous and rich and then other times you're like down in the dumps yeah. and you're you're doing these like instant gratification things out of habit or out of whatever base emotions and you're yeah. justifying it in your head like okay this is research for my company come yeah. on you know yeah so have you done any pivots with the Gio yet yeah yeah so um mentioned we started out with japanese co-founders uh we started out doing a, a manga it was just a passion project manga is a japanese comic book um and then we in 2021 the nft craze kind of took off and we we started looking at that really seriously we started developing our own nft project uh and then we announced it in february started like really seriously trying to build something in March. And by the time we were ready to launch in May, all of that stuff started to happen with uh, Three Arrows Capital. And um, uh, what was that other big one that failed um, in crypto? But anyway, in May, the NFT market started to tank. Um, and then you just had kind of a domino effect over the last year of really bad news out of crypto. Everybody remembers FTX mm -hmm. and... Uh, um, of course, you know, it continues into 2023 with some some stuff going on with Coinbase and um, 
we used to have a big crypto exchange here called Bittrex. They're no longer working. Uh, so crypto, unfortunately, there's a lot of hype that goes into it. it there's a lot of hype cycles. You know, people um, get really exuberant about it. Crypto prices go up, investment interest goes up, markets uh, go crazy for crypto. And then there's what they call crypto winners when people like stop paying attention and there's less activity. So you really have to, I mean, me as a founder, I can't have, have my biz depend on, first of all, the prices are super volatile. And second of all, the hype cycle is just really hard to predict. So one of our biggest pivots was creating this game and, and incorporating the game into our business model. Um, it's nice now focusing on something that's got a physical component. Uh, one of the things that I, that I kind of took from some of the accelerators that we've done is accepting money for services. For a long time, I was running my own consulting business. And in consulting, you know, there's this crazy sales cycle. Um, you have certain projects that have a time limit. You work with the client, you finish it out, they close out the deal and you've got to find a new client or, or try to continue the business a different way. Or, um, you know, you, you deliver this service like marketing, communications, et cetera. And you have things that you can show that you did, but what's the impact on the business? That's not as clear for a lot of people. And, and it's hard to measure in a lot of ways. Like, okay, so you, you did a, a hundred Facebook posts this month, but what did that, you know, yeah. how did that affect my bottom line? Yeah. And you can't really say. Um, so that accepting payment for services is, is a challenging business, but accepting payment in exchange for a physical good is really clear. You sell this box, they give you money, the deal's done, you know? How do you figure out your price and model for all the stuff you're doing? There's some market research involved and there's some uh, basically calculations based on the cost. Yeah, that's so, it. What so, are other people doing? How much is it costing me to do this? So how does someone win at your game? They defeat the other players. Okay. Um, what's, what's your like... Um, are you gonna have any more games coming on online later on, or this is your, your one one game? So basically? what's interesting about this game is that we've got different maps. Mm -hmm. Uh so we're gonna be releasing different maps over time. Our first map, actually I have it here. I can grab it if you yeah. want. And the game's gonna be like based on like different time periods and stuff like that. Uh yeah, so the, the maps are gonna have different themes. This is the first production map that we're that we're doing. It's called Kraken. Um let me get this out. Yeah, let's put this camera right here. This is the Kraken map. <laughs> this is the Kraken map right here. Um, and yeah, the, the idea is you've got a giant octopus squid thing that you're fighting across. And the next map that we're going to do is called Kaiju, um, named after Godzilla. We obviously okay. can't use that name for legal reasons. I mean, hopefully we'll be able to work with them at some point. But, yeah. Um, the idea is we're going to have different maps that come out with a similar setup where you can collect different types of maps and, and the gameplay experience will be different on each one. How long does the game last? Um, we've got it down to where it's about an hour, okay. but it depends on who's playing. Okay. If people are very cautious, it can take up to two hours or more. If people just want to fight, we've gotten games done in under 15 minutes. Who's like your perfect customer for this? Parents of kids. Okay. Yeah. Um, middle class, upper middle class, maybe where uh, you want to buy cool things for your kids and cool experiences. So if the kids love it, then they'll continue to be maps and characters. And will people, regardless of cultural background or country, understand the game? Yes. Okay, so someone like Israel, someone like Saudi Arabia, someone like, you know, Kenya. If they've played a video game in the past, they'll be able to understand this. Okay. There's like core concepts of health and energy where you want to keep your health above zero mm. um, and energy you spend to do different actions. Um, there is some complexity. So you have treasure chests, you collect weapons and items, and those all have different kind of abilities. And how many people are your team right now? So we've got um, three on the core team and then two other developers that are kind of contributing in different ways and another engineer who's contributing also in, in like a part-time role. How do you decide this? Like, suppose, like, how do you decide my next hire needs to be marketing? Number eight needs to be this. Number nine needs to be this. How do you, how do you do a process? Like, you know, 
I need to make these hires this time? Or do you, is it based on like number of employee? Do you based on revenue you have? Like how do you make those decisions? What's really nice is um, we can do, we did a lot of our stuff through like freelancer.com or Upwork or Fiverr, where if we need something done, we can hire somebody out. Uh, and once it's done, it's done. You don't have to keep a relationship uh, when you don't need that service. So that's been really important. Um, I think that the hiring needs are going to change once we have more revenue and once we have a better idea of like how much we're going to need to produce, how much we're going to want to sell. And um, then we're, we're going to need to be a lot more serious about bringing on people full time. So have you been able to validate people on Upwork and Fiverr can do what they can do? That's a good question. I think um, there's a certain art to it. Uh, there's when you read enough profiles, when you go through enough profiles and you kind of in a, in a certain way, you have to work backwards. So you have to kind of almost know what the end product needs to look like before you order the service. So if you know you need a game box design and you have you post a project on freelancer.com, for example, I'm looking for someone to design a game box. You get 150 different bids and you're going through these different bids, looking at their portfolios. Um, I ask really specific questions like, have you done this exact type of project in the past? Like, have you designed game boards before? If, if yes, send me your portfolios of specific examples of when you've done this specific thing. So it's, it's really nice having uh, clear goals that are small and attainable. Um, if you're going to ask somebody on Fiverr or Upwork or any of these platforms to build you software, that's more complex. Yeah, that's very vague. Yeah. And um, if you haven't done that before, you can run into some really big costs yeah. and unpredictable stuff. I know one of my Christmas, a lot of tech people, like a lot of tech people, they build stuff, build stuff, they never complete anything, right? So I'm going to interview these tech people, I'm going to interview for my own, my own opening, like, Show me something you've completed, right? What does that mean, complete, though? What do you mean I by mean, that's that? That's a good point. Right? I mean, like, it has to be more like this work a product for a couple of months, right? Like, it has to be some kind of end product, you know? Of course, everything did. I mean, you could have a good point, actually. Everything like kids don't get improved or whatever. But, like, yeah. It has to be something like, prove to me, don't just go from project to project, right? Yeah. And yet, I mean, even if they do go from project to project, the projects that they're working on are making money if they're yeah. big projects then still that's a valuable experience i think that's true and it's not always the engineer that depends on how successful the project is yeah. it's more the the, the vision behind yeah. it where you can bring that technology together in a way that actually works no, that's, that's, that's actually a good point so what's a when you interview people what's the question you ask that is that kind of random that most people don't ask Hmm. I like to ask questions from engineers. I like to ask questions that are kind of related to values, mm -hmm. like what's important for them in developing. And um, one of my values, for example, is uh, open sourcing technology and data privacy and uh, being able to like um, protect users in a way. So I want to make sure that the people I'm working with kind of have similar values. Okay. Well, of course I ask, I ask people like, you know, What's something that you're proud of that's not in your resume or LinkedIn, right? Like most people don't know, right? That gives them a chance to like open up on the sauce to you know, brag, so to speak, right? Yeah. I think that's a that's a good question. I like to ask questions that are gonna define our working relationship, you know? So if if somebody that that can often reveal something about somebody that makes it a good fit. Yeah. And I'm sure you've had that uh in the past where yeah. You're interviewing somebody, they say something unexpected, and you're like, I vibe with this. I, yeah. I vibe with this person. I like to ask questions that are more like, um, le less about personal and more about like their business approach, yeah. their like approach to working and getting stuff done. Yeah. Um, and, and if I vibe with their work philosophy and their philosophy of mm -hmm. tech, then it, it might be a good fit. Yeah. Of course, like I'm from Texas, someone says, I hate everyone from Texas. It's okay. You're not working for me, then don't. Work. <laughs> this is a bad example, probably. Um, so you're talking about your company, Sumba. Can you go more detail about how the company has started, what you focus on now, what the future vision is for it? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we, like I said, I, um, I think I mentioned this earlier. We, I started writing a science fiction novel in college and um, generally just kept working on it, kept dabbling. And then in 2019, I met a, a Japanese person 
um, who invest in different companies. We had a good relationship and he invited me to come to Tokyo where I met some of the other members of my team. And uh, we started working on a Japanese style comic book. Um, that was in 2019 and then COVID hit. Um, and then the NFT craze kind of happened. We started trying to launch an NFT project. Uh, NFTs are complex. There, there might be some really good use cases in the future, but then there's also this like hype driven speculation, pricing, all about profit, um, which that's not entirely what I'm trying to do. I definitely want an NFT collection that has utility and, and really connects the holders to value um, in the project. But I want, I want to have a company that, um, first of all, the, the idea of launching a physical good is super interesting to me because, like I mentioned, there's this transaction where somebody pays you for a physical good, you receive that money, you can uh, put that on the books, and it's it's really clean from an accounting perspective and from like a ethical, philosophical perspective. You get a good, I get payment. Um, down the road, we want to create an experience where there's this hybrid physical digital, more than just your phone, where it's like this um, digital aspect to playing a board game in real life that augments the experience. The idea is like we were talking about earlier, kids are, are obsessed with their phones and it's like a drug in a lot, a lot of ways where you take it away and they have withdrawals, but is it possible? Cause there's a lot of good things about phones. There's a lot of good things about technology. Tinder, for example, as much heat as it gets, people meet the love of their lives on there. And it's, it's a lot more efficient. You know, you find somebody on Tinder that you really connect with that has, um, you know, the, the right values or the right humor or whatever. And you don't need to go on any more dates. Yeah. You don't need to try to look for the right person anymore or travel booking apps, right? Where before the internet traveling was a really uncertain thing. You're going to this other country and you have a credit card, maybe you pay for a hotel and you know, everything after that is up in the air. Yeah. Uh, but now you, the, the experience is so much easier and better through our phones, through our technology. So is there a way to use technology to reconnect kids, to re-engage kids with real world experiences and maybe even deepen relationships with family and friends. Um, while the phone isn't like the obsessive part of it where it's like a facilitator of this experience. That's what I want to create. And what's the future vision for it? Like you want to be like the number one gaming company in America or like what's that goal? Um, so what we want to do is create a fan community that's engaged and loyal. And number one, I mean, you can create metrics where you're number one at something. Oh yeah. You can yeah. create that, uh, idea. I don't know if we're going to be able to compete with like Activision Blizzard or, or, um, uh, Ubisoft or something like that, where, you know, you have these AAA games that spend hundreds of millions or billions of dollars on, on their development. I don't know if that's what we want to do. What I, what I would prefer to see is a community of loyal fans that really understands the product and has a lot of fun playing it and become collectors to augment our, um, uh, our, our fan base and build a viable business. Uh, what I really want to do, what I really want to do is we have this, these plans for a comic book that uses a 3D city. Um, so I want to create a... 3D city that we can use as the backdrop for our comic book. So basically, um, you can have our illustrator choose a camera angle within the city, take a snapshot, and use that snapshot as the background for a comic book frame. So then you have this like seamless transition between reality and a comic book and a video game where you can actually visit the city where all of this takes place and even control a character there, for example. Um, and I mean, from that point, if we can get there, there's all sorts of really cool, fun things we can do. What's the risk of someone getting too involved in a game character? I think that there's always a risk of people getting too obsessed. Um, you mentioned risk. Yeah, I mean... There's a in, in Japan, there's a, a super fan 
there's a term for fans that, that are super fans. They, they're called otaku. Uh, they go overboard. They dress like the characters. They are obsessed with these worlds. Uh, um, what happens if they're too obsessed? I mean, that really depends on a person and it's, it's hard to say. There's a lot of worlds out there already that are engaging and, and have really active communities. Do we want to become like that? Yes. Do we want people to lose their sense of self in a world? No. Um, we want to create experiences, people that are um, really exciting, new, innovative, unique, but that also kind of augment their real lives and don't take away from them. Is there an optimal age to play this game? Like you want people from 8 to 80 playing? Or it's like more specific? We're 10 plus. Okay. Uh, I think 10 is kind of like, we, we've played with players as young as 8. Um, but with 10, that's kind of like the, the starting point where okay. the gameplay starts to make a lot of sense. And uh, it's still really fun with people, you know, in their 30s and 40s and 50s. So um, there's different windows of the ideal group. I think it's probably better to play with people who are closer to your own age or cross-generational where it's like parents and kids. So you see this like being a family game or like friend game or like? We want it to be both. Okay. Um, we wanted to have the gameplay experience to have kind of um, things that are attractive for for both types. Okay. Um, so what what's the, what's some mistakes you made so far on your entrepreneur journey? Mistakes. <laughs> you, you can't say everything. It's hard because some of the mistakes that we made led us to the point that we're at. And even though they would have saved us time and money, um, maybe we would never have gotten here if it wasn't for those mistakes. Uh, I think that, yeah, this is a hard one to answer. It, it's, there are certain things that we explored from a tech perspective that, um, do you know what tech debt is? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that left us with some tech debt uh, that I definitely would have done differently if I would have, even like back in October, if I would have had the knowledge I have now, I would have started developing in a different way. Um, so we developed an app for iPhone, okay. um, which means we coded in Swift, we use Xcode. And unfortunately, that leaves us uh, excluding Android users. So if you've got an Android, you can't use our app right because now. Because Android, like, even though I'm an Apple lover, Pack is Android is like what 80% of the market, something like that. Yeah. And a lot of the people in the board game and video game space are Android users. So you automatically exclude those people. Yeah. Um, so if I would have gone back, I would have started immediately developing for a mobile web kind of platform. Like a web which, app. Yeah. For mobile specifically, yeah. though, uh, which is where we're moving now. So we're developing an app in Unity. Um, and we're aiming to launch that for a mobile web experience. Okay. Um, but on the other hand, having the iOS app that's, sorry, I thought it was a call, uh, that's live now is, um, gives us basically a really good idea of what the tech needs to look like on the Unity side. So uh, having all of that tech already written, deployed, tested, debugged um, is, is really good for us too. It's hard to say. I mean, what's, what's the advice you have for like a new entrepreneur coming up? Well, it depends on what sector they're. Let's say they they have an idea that they haven't done product market fit. Haven't talking. They have an idea, they have a little bit of money, and it's going to go from there. Uh, what are their goals? Are they trying to actually build a business, or are they just like trying to get something on their resume, or they're just trying? They, to... they want to build a business. They want, they want to build. A... Talk, talk to as many successful founders, mentors, investors, entrepreneurs as possible family members, even people who are in unrelated businesses, talk to them about the challenges of business. If you've never run a business before, find out what it's going to take. There's so many, um, what are they called? Um, uh, hidden stones under yeah. the water, right? Yeah. Where you don't, like, like you said, you don't know what you don't know. And mostly this comes in the form of legal, yeah. tax, accounting, the unsexy hiring, stuff, the unsexy all stuff. the stuff that runs the in the background, stuff marketing, sales, product market fit, go to market. Yeah, you've got a cool idea that, that you can get excited behind. You've got a, a way to explain this idea to other people that gets them excited too. But are you ready to be the CEO? Are you ready 
to be the person who's going to be running all of the stuff, the sales, the marketing. What's your sales cycle look like? What's your competitive landscape look like? Yeah. Are you Market ready to research. put? Are you ready to put in the legwork? Um, on the yeah the market research side that roll up your sleeves and get the boring stuff done you yeah yeah um, i tell people all the time they want to be a founder like you know like my advice to you is like go work for another founder like work for another startup like six months a year and learn the best you can then do your own business right of course most people are gonna listen to that they want to be no start their own thing as soon as they can yeah yeah um if you've ne if you don't understand how it's going to make money then before you spend any of your own money, make sure that you know how your business is going to turn a profit. Yeah. And um, if, <laughs> if you're not mentally ready to go through hardship, just don't do it. Yeah. It will eat you up and spit you out. So true. So true. Um, that's the unglamorous side. That's the unsexy side. Uh, when I was going through one of my accelerators, one of the mentors was saying, um, you know, 95% of startups fail, but everyone in this room thinks that they're in the 5%. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So there's, there's like you said, there's some kind of mental insanity yeah. even um, that kind of goes hand in hand with the foundry um, journey where you you have to have conviction in yourself and in your business that you are going to be the exception. I like to say sometimes like you have to believe in yourself, even when you don't believe in yourself. Yeah. Right? Even if you say, man, I, I, I suck at this. You still got to believe in yourself. Right. No, yeah. No. Oh, oh, and of course, yeah, be ready to hear no a lot. Yeah. All the time. All the time. And if that's something that you can't handle, just pack or, up. Or some version of no. Yeah. And if, the thing is like, you gotta be soft for no, but when they say that, it really means no. Also, don't think that it's easy to raise money. It's incredibly difficult to raise money, especially from VCs. They and the thing is, like, people don't realize, like, it doesn't matter what the economy is like, it's hard to raise funds. Like, even back from the 2020, they give money away. Most people did still not raise money, right? Yep. Yeah. So it doesn't matter how the economy is. Like, I think 1% of people raise VC money is incredibly hard, right? Yes. So I, I, I have a friend who's a VC. He, I think it was something like, he's out of Miami. He's like, I have every thousand pitch, he might invest in one. Yep. So 999 people mid pitch them to get a no. You only say one. I think he invested like I think he does five investments. You get like real small fund, right? Yeah. Things like I want to say he's like climate change, right? So five investments per year talking like five thousand people. Another big thing for people considering to found their own companies, especially in the tech space, if you're not a programmer, mm -hmm. if you don't uh, have someone who's on your team as a programmer. That's going to increase it's your so, costs. It's so much fucking harder. It's going to increase I, I, your I costs that, yeah. a lot. And like one, like I said, my check channels, like some of the symbols, like I had a great tech person, junior developer, right? Doing great things. She got a job offer from T-Mobile. I can't compete with that. Like, what, what can I say, right? Stay on a few more months, and I might get free funds and pay you like half your salary, you get T-Mobile, you know, like. Yeah, exactly. And uh, if you don't have a developer who's on the founding team as a founder of a tech company. Yeah. It's so hard. You're going to spend a lot of money. Yeah. I'm sure you, you can attest to that. Yeah. I've been lucky. I've like, I've bootstrapped. Like, I've got free AWS credits. I've got internships, you know, but it's like bit by bit. Right. You know, people, of course, people have disappointed me, ghosted me. They've like, I would say stolen money from me. I stolen money from me. Right. There's different things. Like people leave too early, too soon, but yes. And, and I mean, a lot of times as a first time founder, you don't know what you need from the tech perspective. No. Like I said, I, I started building, I'm, this isn't my first time that I've tried to launch a company. I have another company that failed in the past and a successful consulting company that I ran for five years. Um, but when, when you're building something, um, you may not know that the way that you're building it yeah. is going to leave you with what's called tech debt. Tech debt which gives you problems down the road or where maybe you don't know what a user story is, how that works, you know? Yeah. Like when I first saw like tech people solve problem solvers, I just type tech person code me AI that drinks bourbon, right? Yeah. No, no, it has to be like detail, detail, detail. Like it's, it's insane. Yeah. The challenge, but it's a lot of fun too. Mm -hmm. But like, I have another thing. Sometimes you crush it and sometimes it crushes you. Yep. Of course, I found you get fucking crushed a lot. Don't get crushed. So, um, is there any task that I asked you that I haven't asked you yet or anything else you want to talk about? 
Mm, I don't know. We've talked about a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Seems like we went through the whole gamut of stuff. AI, simulation, yeah. business, philosophy, DCs, philosophy, Roman history, Roman history, all that brick and Morty, <laughs> all that good stuff. Have you watched the solar opposites? Uh, yes. Okay. I watched a few I, episodes I, I of that. I watched that, watching that. Yeah. That's on Hulu, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's still weird to me to have the Rick voice playing the other person's voice, right? <laughs> it's like, that's Rick. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's fucking weird though. Yeah. Yeah, man. So anything else? I think that covers it. Okay, cool. Uh, I think that's good. Thanks for your time. Before we get out, you can give us any advice or wisdom or anything you want to talk about. Um, so I, what I want to say is that we're coming into an age when it seems like so many things are possible and we we can create anything we want. And yet these things that we're creating are meant to be addicting and obsessive. I think that it's important to find out your true essence and be um, conscious of the mental health challenges and find your own way to, to deal with it, to stay sane and to um, live your best life, I guess. So uh, thank you for your time today. Really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And so listen, as a reminder, we're doing the crowdfunding campaign at Kevin's HR. Also have a hackathon going on in the PISS competition. So reach out to me more, more, more information on that. Thanks for your time today. And remember to be great every day.